This video contains subject matter that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are the type to require a warning throughout a video or show, let this message serve as your warning. This channel discusses the harsh reality of true crime. If this warning is not sufficient for you, consider a different genre and unsubscribe from my channel immediately. going on everybody whoa yeah I missed the entire uh, day's Jody Arias uh, coverage although I've seen it before but I always hate watching her get up there and hold the survivor shirt up what a joke what are you rubbing it in the face of a family that you survived and you freaking murdered the hell out of him? Yeah. <laughs> By the way, for those who watched that, what did you guys think of that? When you when she was up there trying to um, talk about her and her surviving and the t-shirt and everything. Didn't you want to just vomit when you saw her hold up that t-shirt? It's absolutely sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, also thanks for the freaks for hitting the the goal for the day again. I think they're like fifty and one or something. So we've got. Uh, I'm just gonna thank people now because I missed it. So Ka thanks, Kathy Chapin, Annie T, K Me, Kubi, Traveling Teresa, Kubi again, Kathy Chapin, Annie T, Alley Cat, Annie T. Seems like uh, some re repeats in there. Uh, Annie T with a cat eye, and then Traveling Teresa with a cat eye, then Lauren, Traveling Teresa again, Kathy Chapin, Annie T, Annie T, K Me, Kathy uh, Chapin, and Caligal 3. Come on, where were the rest of you guys in there? You know, you had like the same five people in there. All right. So thank you for that show, and now we're on to a new one, and you see the goal in the upper left hand corner there. Be nice to keep reaching them uh, so that I can continue to have the support on the channel and also be able to support the um, different charities and the DNA fund that I like to fund from the income that I get. All right. And I think you guys all like them too. We've funded 10 different DNA projects. And one of them, there's a solve that we are waiting for the press conference to come out. All right. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> there's Tyler Hackner again, the man who types in absolute. Oh, there's a high up there. Yeah, but always gives away memberships. Very cool. Very cool. So Steph from California was gift or Canada, I guess, was gifted a membership by Tyler Hackner. All right. So today's show is going to be a lot of the newspaper articles again, reading them. Hopefully you guys thought uh, last night's show was interesting, the Cheryl Coker case. Uh, well, now she's not going to sing for Chris. Yeah. Well, it's her birthday tomorrow, but she doesn't even. She hardly even watches the show. You know, <laughs> she she does her own thing. Yeah. Uh, what's your face for, Cindy? Man, you're just always so. Uh, uh, let's see. Last night was yeah. I thought it was a good one. I'd like to get those family members on again at some point. See if there's anything new. 
No, hers is tomorrow. Is yours today, Jessica? But it'd be nice to get something up on the board there on the stream. The stream goal, though, you guys. So we can get moving here with some a little momentum. Uh, well, I won't be singing happy birthday to your husband's birthday, Midwest girl. I can tell you that. Uh, let's see. I know, Gray, I sing them. Right. Huh? Right. Annie T again. Well, thanks, Annie T. <laughs> and the same <laughs> day crew people. Man, it'd be nice if a uh, little like bit more that. evenly distributed amongst people. But hey, thanks very much, Annie T. And Annie T. And Wow, traveling Teresa with the dancing avocado right off the bat, everybody. I'm Deceptor, look at it, I'm just gonna die. And KB! Well, let me let me fix the. It looks like that's not switching over again. I'll start. Let's go. Before somebody goes, great, it doesn't switch over. I watch for everybody else, even though I'm not helping out at all. I want I want to complain. Let's see. There we go. Thank you, Laconic. All right, guys, ready? I'm gonna rely on you guys, okay? Because I am going to be reading stuff. <laughs> Man, this the one. This one was so hard to find stuff on. You know, you know what's amazing is I I bought all of these different newspaper, um, you know archive subscriptions to various websites and it showed up on none of them but it did show up on the google free archive where you go out and look on in their papers and there it was yeah pretty amazing so thanks google <coughs> they don't have as good of uh like saving out type of thing you have to like screen grab it it seems like maybe there's something i'm missing but I'm not even sure what you're talking about, Bird Brain. Yeah. You'll have to uh, talk about something else. I have no idea. You mean Dylan Rounds, for God's sakes? Wow. Why don't you just look it up? Uh, let's see. Welcome, Teresa P. Yeah, so this is Linda Hamilton, Linda June Hamilton, not THE Linda Hamilton from Terminator, okay? This is back in 1977, September 20th. Uh, she's missing, and her husband was murdered. So I'm just going to go through whatever we got here, and then we'll go to get to the next article. But uh, I was able to find articles on Google, so they're hard to... You know, you have to kind of read them. Well, there you go. That's a perfect little distance there. So it said, uh, David A. Hamilton, 28, was found shot to death in the living room of his home. And we can type that in. Let's see. 
12055 South Avenue in North Lima, Ohio. It said something like EXT, I'm not sure. But we'll just think that's it right there. Yeah. Wow, look at that, right? It lands right on a house. I guarantee you. Well, let's just see what it looks like, but I would bet money that's the probably the same one. Yeah, looks maybe some reciting on it at some point, but definitely that looks like that could be could have been around in 1977, right? Hey, thanks, Kit Kat. What's going on? I think you should come on again this Halloween. We'll have to do a huge Halloween thing again like we did that one year where we had like five or six people up on the screen. That was pretty fun. And thank you, your gypsy. All right, so there we got the house here. Uh, we, I don't need, I'm not going to save it. Well, why not? Hold on. Uh, might be related to some other stuff. Linda, Jean, Hamilton, 19, 77, 09, Chewbacca. And there's the house. Oh, that's right. When you copy and paste it, just there you go. All right. <clears throat> you know, I don't know. You know, that looks like that's different on the satellite. It likely has been rebuilt. Let me see. No, no, it's just, wait, one more over. What was the one that just looked, looked totally, went way better than that a second ago? That's weird. Is it right here? Wasn't that weird? A minute ago that looked really clear. Now it's not. Maybe it's the other side of the road now. Interesting. Yeah, it was more like this. Wow, what's going on there? <laughs> Holy crap, it like totally changed, but... Okay, well that's the house right there. <clears throat> Thank you, Alley Cake. Okay, here we go. So, uh, David A. Hamilton, 28, was found shot to death Tuesday in the living room of his home at 12055 South Eve, or South Avenue, and his wife, Linda, 28, is missing, raising the possibility, police say, that she was kidnapped by the murderer. Beaver Township Police were called to the Hamilton home at 9.50 a.m. by a neighbor, Eugene, um, S-A, looks like maybe S-A-B-H, maybe, who had made, wait, let me, back out one well maybe Saul I don't know it's hard to tell who had made the discovery Corporal Richard Graft a coroner investigator our, our Armin Casanta interviewed the children of the couple and pieced together an account of events of Monday night Mr. and Mrs. Hamilton spent the night at home with their children, Melinda, three, Christopher, hold on, yeah, Look, maybe five, Christopher, three, and watched a television football game. Melinda uh, told Cassanta that when the game ended, her mother put her and her brother to bed. The children heard nothing that followed. 
Sometime after, someone entered the home and fired several shots from a 38 caliber pistol. At least two shots hit Hamilton in the head and body. A stray shot was found lodged in the wall of the kitchen. The children told Casanta that when they woke up yesterday and could not find their mother, but found their father sleeping on the living living room floor, but could not wake him up, could not wake him up. The children found some soft drinks, dressed, and went out to play. <laughs> Jesus, man, that's crazy. The children told Casanta they went, when they went, God, I can't read it, that when they woke up yesterday and could not find their mother, but found their father sleeping on the living room floor, he was actually shot and killed, actually, but could not wake him up. Thanks, Jessica Schubach. The children found some soft drinks, dressed, and went to play. After one more attempt to wake their father, they went to the neighbor's house. Uh, Saw found Hamilton dead in a pool of blood. The television set was still on, tuned to the channel that broadcast the game. Uh, he was pronounced dead at 11.55 a.m. at Southside Hospital. Dr. Nathan D. Belinke, uh Mahoney, county coroner, ru ruled the death homicide attributing to shock and hemorrhage from the gunshot wound. Uh, the Hamilton's 1977 Monte Carlo was found in a field a mile away from the scene. Wow, so the killer took the car. Um, scene of the murder at about 1.15 p.m. yesterday by a residence. The keys were found in the ignition and there was gasoline in the tank. Casanta said footprints. Listen to, look, listen to this crazy crap right here though. Casanta said footprints of a barefoot woman and a something something man traveled away from the car Mrs. Hamilton's purse wallet credit cards and identification were all found in the home woman and oh shoed man I think is what it's saying barefoot woman and a shoed man trailed away from the car so they can see the bare feet of her and the footprints of the man that kidnapped her so Mrs. Hamilton's purse, wallet, credit cards, and identification were all found in the home, as were money, watches, and expensive rings, indicating robbery was not the motive. If she had left the home of her own volition, she would have certainly taken her purse, wallet, credit cards, and identification, and doubtless uh, a pair of shoes. And all points broadcast and extensive searching turned up no trace of Miss Hamilton. Miss Hamilton, 28, is 5 foot 6, weighs 135 pounds, and has brown hair and eyes. She wears horn rimmed glasses and has a scar on the bridge of her nose. Mrs. Hamilton is employed as a waitress at the Cloverleaf restaurant on Route 7. Her husband was an electrician. Hamilton's body is is at the Woods and Son Funeral Home in Letonia. What's the name of that? Clover Leaf Restaurant? Let's see. North Lima and Waffles? No. I said it was on Route 7. A mile away, right? There it is, seven. So let's see. Rest thou routes on route seven. Now make sure to type away, everybody. Talk about whatever the hell you want to talk about. Alright, right seven. That way I can say, hey, are you guys listening? <laughs> Yeah! Awesome. 
No, I wonder if that's it right around here. There's a tavern. Let's see, is that a mile? And it said... Hamilton's body was in the wood. Okay, Mrs. Hamilton is employed as a waitress at the Cloverleaf Restaurant on Route 7. It doesn't really say exactly what direction that is. So, anyways, somewhere off of this route right here. Uh, I'm wondering if that was it right there. Okay, so we got that. And we're moving to... Now it's... Um, the, that was September. There might have been some more articles, but you kind of have to manually look it up. So, And this is one from December 29th, 1977. Scientific clues in the David Hamilton murder were in the hands of Beaver Township Police as long ago as two months, but investigators felt they were, there were not enough evidence to support a murder charge against Hamilton's wife. <laughs> they were actually thinking the wife had something to do with it. Yeah, I mean, it kind of, you know, makes sense. She's missing, and but then, you, you know, you guys had the footprints and other footprints in the woods, right? At the township... And the township policemen do not waver from their belief that someone besides Miss Hamilton may have pulled the trigger, whether acting alone or as an accomplice in the husband's murder. Miss Hamilton's whereabouts, unknown, has been charged with premeditated Miss Hamilton's oh so she has been charged with premeditated murder of her husband by investigators from the uh, Mahoning County Sheriff's Department. The county investigators are not inclined to say just what evidence they have, but their case seems to pivot in part on tests made on the bullets that killed Hamilton and those that killed a Pennsylvania man eight days later on fingerprints gathered from the Pennsylvania truck. This Hamilton whereabouts, unknown, has been charged. Hmm. We didn't feel that we had enough evidence based on just having the bullets to pursue a warrant, said Captain Paul Pergoviani of the Beaver Town uh, Township Police. I was shocked when I read in the paper that the Sheriff's Department had issued a warrant as Ziegler's murder near the warrant. Well, let's see. Let me go back to the one before. A second had issued a warrant okay then starts over here Ziegler's murder near the Warrendale Route 19 interchange of Pennsylvania Turnpike Pirgo Viani said but even with the added knowledge of the partial set of fingerprints the township felt that the evidence was too meager to warrant a murder charge Look, if Allegheny County, which has the prints, did feel they had enough for a warrant, how could the Sheriff's Department issue one when all we gave them were the bullets? If the bullets were hard evidence against Mrs. Hamilton, uh, Pergiviani said his department would have sought a warrant. Neither, neither he added, neither he added to the matching bullets prove Miss Hamilton pulled the trigger in either murder. If they find her, Miss Hamilton, today or tomorrow, they better be ready to prosecute. But unless they got some additional information after we turned over the two bullets, I don't see how they can prove the charge. Yeah, I mean, does she have a connection to the other person that was killed with, a, with the same weapon? Acting on a tip received Wednesday that Miss Hamilton's body could be found along Pine Lake Road, probably a psychic uh, township. Police conducted an air search of several strip mining operations along the roadway early today, uh, early day, but uh, failed to uh, find. I think it's what it says. It says find any evidence that Miss Hamilton had been killed. The air search was conducted by Patrolman William. Pier uh, well, it's got the same name. Pierre Viani of the Springfield Township Police Department. Snyder said that they spotted several vacant buildings while checking the banks of several lakes and ponds in the area and expected to check out other parts of the area. 
Let's see. Down here it says, Pierre Giviani said the Sheriff's Department has not told Beaver Police that if any additional evidence has been found. Pierre Giviani believes an... This is kind of a long one. An unseen suspect may still lie at the heart of the case. Pierre Viani noted that two sets of tracks, those of a man and those of a barefoot woman, led from the Hamilton's 1977 Monte Carlo. So remember they found the Monte Carlo Park? Uh, led from the Mo Hamilton 1970 Monte Carlo, which was found about a mile from the home where Hamilton's body was found. Corporal Ron Gala, who helped in the Hamilton investigation, is now assigned to the unsolved slaying of Mr. and Mrs. John Davis last month, said the tracks showed that the woman and man left the car from the driver's side. Huh, so he sort of pulled her out of, she was in the passenger side, and he pulled her out. We followed those tracks to an area near the first car, but they became wiped out due to a heavy rain that day, said Gala. He believes the two got into another car parked nearby. The presence of the second set of tracks and the fact that the woman was barefoot led to an early theory that Mrs. Hamilton may have been kidnapped at the time her husband was slain. <laughs> well, it sounds like a very good theory, right? From talks with neighbors, relatives, and employees at the Cloverleaf restaurant where Mrs. Hamilton worked, Pergviani is convinced that she did not shoot her husband, but the person she left with did, he said. The Hamiltons never owned a 38 caliber revolver, said Pergi Pier, uh, Avani. That's a tough one. Hey, thank you, American lady. The Hamiltons never owned a 38 caliber revolver. Ziegler, uh, so it says, uh, Hamilton and Ziegler both died of 38 caliber, uh, died of 38 caliber gunshot wounds. He said he was told by neighbors that Hamilton once owned a 22 caliber rifle, but got rid of it. Uh, Pergiviani said one possible, possible motive for Hamilton's murder was an unhappy marriage. He said the neighbors and relatives told him the two often argued and that Hamilton had been known to beat his wife. I talked with Linda four or five times when she worked at the Cloverleaf, said Pergiviani. Uh, she was friendly and people liked her. He said she may have been seeing another man, but was not known to run around. Uh, the detective speculated that another person, possibly a sympathetic friend who knew of Mrs. Hamilton's marital problems, shot Hamilton and that Mrs. Hamilton left with him. Who the second party may have been is still a mystery to Pierre Giviani and the other Beaver investigators. A man questioned a few days after the shooting was cleared by three lie detector tests the partial fingerprints taken from Ziegler's tanker truck are not evidence that Miss Hamilton killed Ziegler. Uh, Pergoliviano said, moreover, that the fingerprints have not, have not, to his knowledge, been conclusively known to be those of Mrs. Hamilton. Captain John Nee of the Allegheny County Task Force said yesterday that Ziegler, an independent milk hauler in western Pennsylvania, could have been napping in his truck alongside the road when he was shot. Ziegler had made a run in Marshall Township, Pennsylvania. Nee, who was second in command of a special investigative unit assigned to the string of unsolved murders in southwestern Pennsylvania, said robbery may have been the motive for Ziegler's murder. This is just a, another person, but the same bullet uh, shell casing killed both these people. Caberviani admitted that the relationship between his department and the Mahoning County Sheriff's Department has been strained at times. His department, uh, I don't really care about that. He said he was in the park. Let's see, is there any more to that one? Yeah, I guess there's one more here. The failure of the Sheriff's Department to keep in touch with Beaver Police have, may have harmed the murder investigation. 
Pergiviani admitted that animosity between the Sheriff's Department and the Beaver Township Police heightened after the Hamilton murder. Little aggravations, Sheriff Cruiser, that did not respond or dawdled when Beaver Township asked for help. So, anyways, there, now he's just complaining about not getting help. What's this part here? Uh, Warren Pergiviani said the Beaver Police who busted his butt. Yeah. He fears, too, that the murder warrant might place Mrs. Hamilton's life in jeopardy. The second person was a party to her husband's murder. Miss Hamilton may literally become become the woman who knew too much. I honestly believe that this warrant means Linda is going to turn up dead. Would you carry around the only eyewitness that could identify you as a person that killed your husband? Yeah, we've talked about that many times. All right, then uh, I guess the next day, this is sort of similar. Uh, an FBI spokesman in Cleveland said Thursday that the warrant charging Mrs. Hamilton with unlawful flight to avoid prosecution had not yet been issued. <laughs> I think she was just abducted myself. I mean, I mean, if she's got bare feet, why not? Why didn't you put shoes on? If you're in on something with somebody, wouldn't you just have shoes? It sounds like they were watching television. It was just kind of random. The handgun used to kill Hamilton and Ziegler murder apparently had not been covered. The fingerprints still being examined. And uh, they might offer some evidence to her to either... De I can't really read it. It's blurry right there. So move on to the next one. So this is in 1978. About uh, almost a year later, this one. So it says, Two patrolmen who stepped up to issue a routine traffic summons to a man whose car had a broken taillight were told, I'm glad you stopped me. I just committed a murder, according to Detective Sergeant Henry Rogers. Since he was pulled over, Kenneth Taylor, 37, of North Lima, Ohio, has admitted killing 17 people in Tennessee, Ohio, Pennsylvania in the past two years, police say, his account of the most recent slaying, that of the owner of the car he was driving, was verified. Taylor has been charged with murder, armed robbery, and auto theft. Rogers said Taylor confessed to the slaying of David Willie, whose body was found in a downtown alley after officers followed Taylor's directions. The car Taylor drove was registered to Willie. Officer said Taylor, who is unemployed, told them he had planned to go on a slaying spree in Nashville, then Lake, and then take his own life. We don't know if he's fantasizing all these murders or just what, Detective Bill Robick said. He's a very intelligent person. He's a little erratic in his conversation at times. But he is, he is very aware of what he is saying. He said he had enough ammo to kill several more people in the Nashville area, and he was going to kill himself. Robeck said Taylor provided times and places for the purported murders, but not specific dates or names. He stated that he had been involved with a homicide in Boardman, Ohio, involving a husband and wife, this was earlier in the year, Robeck said. Two officers from the Ohio Beaver Township near North Lima planned to question Taylor today in connection with the slaying last year of David Hamilton, 28. Police said Hamilton's wife, Linda, 28, has been missing since the husband was killed. And then this one is September 9th. The former boardman... Let's see, the hospital examiners are trying to ascertain Taylor's capable of assisting in his defense. Mahoning County and Beaver Township officials are checking the possibility of Taylor's being uh, involved in the murders last year of David Hamilton, 28, and John and Mary Davis, both in their 60s. Allegheny County police still think Edward, see here's the name, Edward Surratt, 36, of Alakippa, Pennsylvania, 
is a prime suspect in a number of western Pennsylvania slangs. Surratt is being held by Florida police for breaking and entering and rape and is wanted by South Carolina authorities for murder. So they, they actually come up with that name and then in the Charlie Project right up here it says Linda was last seen with her husband David A. Hamilton and their young children inside their house on Route 164 in Beaver Township. That morning David was found dead in his home. He had been shot three times with a 38 caliber gun. Linda was missing and so was the couple's vehicle. The couple's children were unharmed. They had slept through uh, their father's murder. In the yard of the house was a bicycle that had been stolen from a neighbor several doors down the street. Hmm. The Hamilton's car was later found parked at the entrance of a closed strip mine off Route 7, near the truck stop where Linda worked. Ah, so that's where it was. Let's see. Truck stops in Lima, Ohio. Isn't that what, what's the name of this town? I thought that's what that was. Hmm. I thought that was the town. It has to be. confusing uh, no but we had route 7 and everything so anyways I guess it doesn't really matter the couple's children were unharmed they had slept through their father's murder in the yard of the house was a bicycle that had been stolen from a neighbor several doors down the street the Hamilton's car was later found parked at the entrance of a closed strip mine off Route 7 near the truck stop where Linda worked. A man's boot prints and a woman's bare footprints led away from the driver's side of the car. Uh, sometimes the woman's prints indicated she was walking and sometimes the prints were dragging as if she was being pulled along. There was no sign of Linda or anything else at the scene. Authorities initially suspected Linda had murdered her husband and a warrant was issued for her arrest. The warrant remained active for, for several years following her disappearance, but investigators eventually concluded that some, of the, some other person or persons had murdered David and Linda had been abducted by the killers, or killer or killers. Edward Arthur Surratt is considered the prime suspect in Gregor's disappearance, this is somebody else, and Freeney's murder, a photograph of him is posted with the case summary. Surratt is suspected of at least 18 murders, including the October 1977 disappearance of 15-year-old Renee Gregor and the murder of 17-year-old boyfriend. He's been in prison since 1978, serving multiple life sentences for burglary, sexual battery, and escape. In 2007, Surratt admitted to killing the Hamiltons, Renee and her boyfriend, and four other people. He stated Linda's body was unrecoverable. In exchange for a statement, he asked to be transferred from his Florida prison to a prison in South Carolina. Authorities said Surratt's admission were vague and they would like more detailed confessions from him. He has not been charged in connection with David's homicide or Linda's, Linda's disappearance. Foul play is suspected in Linda's case, which remains unsolved. There you go. Yeah, I mean, maybe he threw her down some kind of, you know, in a river or a mine. You know, at this point, it's, you're not going to find her. 
I mean, I hope he didn't do something worse than that. <coughs> ah, God. I'm going to remove that one. Let's see. Looks like the bartender bailed here. Yeah, it does. We just kind of froze right up there on the goal there. So remember, if you guys would like to help support the channel, looking up at the goal there. So even though I'm reading, I know it gets a little slower, but these stories are important too. And, you know, I think it's fun to go over them. Hope you guys think it is too. Now we don't know. There, there's no indication what the connection is. I mean, she worked at the bar, but we don't know anything about it. What's by Happer mean? Jesus, man. What does that even mean? Thanks, Travel and Teresa and Music Maker. So that's her, and that, I think that's her husband, and this is Surratt right here. Yeah, that's David Hamilton. This is Linda, and that's the creepy-looking Surratt. I know, That's like right. she was suspected, really? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Actually, and I found where to look right here. This Valley Vindicator. And then, uh, then the rest of the articles I didn't find there, but that's Google had that one. And then there was other newspaper articles on the Google newspaper archive. Huh? What are you talking about, Danielle? You're just... Man, I wish people would just type in full sentences. It'd be great. Uh, yeah, it'd be awesome. I mean, I see a guy up there named Hoppa who said time for dinner. Never seen the person before in my life. Okay. Uh, yeah, just spell better. Maybe people would understand. Maybe put an at symbol too so people know you're referring to a person. Yeah, that guy is pretty scary looking. You ever thought of that? Oh, do you guys hear about that? Those four kids in Peru, or not? Per, was it Peru? What the hell was that? Uh, Colombia, I guess. Yeah, they were in Colombia. The those four children that their plane crashed and. For 40 days, they walked around out in the Amazon and everything, just kind of living and hiding from animals and shit. And they aged from like 4 to 13 or 15, can't remember. But that's wild, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can just tell you right here. It says, uh, four Colombian children survived plane crash, 40 days alone in Amazon jungle. Four indigenous children survived an Amazon plane crash. They killed three adults and then wandered on their own in the jungle for 40 days before being found alive by Colombia soldiers. Officials in South America County, or country announced their rescue Friday bringing a happy ending to a saga with highs and lows. Now new details of the harrowing story have emerged. The kids ages 13, 9, 4, and 11 are expected to remain for at least two weeks in a hospital receiving treatment after their rescue Friday, but some are already speaking and wanting to do more, more than lying on a bed. Manuel Renoke, father of two youngest children 
told reporters outside the hospital Sunday that the oldest of the four surviving children told him their mother was alive for about four days after the plane crashed on May 1st. Well, where the hell was the rescue? See, that's why it's so much better to live in the United States. You know? I mean, they, th they would have been there <laughs> not in four days. Okay? And they never got there in four days. Uh, Fedencino Valencia, Valencia, a child's uncle, told media outlet Noticias uh, Caracol the children were starting to talk, and one of them said they hid in a tree trunk to protect themselves. Uh, they at least are already eating, it says. The children were traveling with their mother from Amazonian village of uh, Araquara, whatever, to San Jose, it doesn't really matter. The Cessna single-engine propeller plane was carrying three adults and the four children when the pilot declared an emergency due to engine failure. The small aircraft fell off the radar a short time later and a search for survivors began. Let's see. Uh, anyways, they said that they ate these certain berries and things like that. Maybe being a native actually helped them a little bit. Yeah, they were dehydrated, malnourished, and, uh, but, you know, they were able to eat stuff. They figured out how to survive. I guess that's the key. All right, now moving on to something else. All right. Another story. No, we don't, we don't need to learn to forage. Okay. Uh, that one of the children had previously won. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we're moving on to 1969, Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry. This one's really, really weird. It's like uh, um, Maura Murray on steroids or something. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. Hey, thank you, Callie Gal 3. This one will probably take the rest of the time. Hope we can get through it. Yeah, so I've already found a ton of, I mean, I spent a lot of time on this case already. Looking it up, I just haven't been able to get to it. Okay, so. Authorities today located the abandoned car of the two young socialites who have been missing in the short resort in the shore resort uh, area since Friday. This is in uh, let's see, Ocean City, New Jersey. Right. Uh, let's see, families of two coeds missing from Ocean City, New Jersey, since Friday appealed to the FBI Sunday to join a search for the girls who disappeared. On their way home, the FBI declined to enter the case at present. Susan Davis of Suburban Camp Hill and Elizabeth Perry of Excelsior, Minnesota, both 19, were reported missing when they failed to return here Friday night. The girl's father, soft drink bottler Wesley S. Davis, 
and paper mill executive Ray Perry rented a helicopter in Philadelphia Sunday morning and flew over the route the girls would have taken from Ocean City to Philadelphia watching for signs of an auto accident not visible from the road. When they found nothing, they appealed to the FBI through reps. John E. Hunt, uh, Republican New Jersey, and Clark McGregor, probably Re Republican Minnesota, uh, a personal friend of the Perry's. I don't know, if the, uh, maybe it's representative. Representative, like maybe Congress representative. We feel there is foul play somewhere along the line, but we don't know where, Miss Davis' father Wesley said. But the FBI said they don't have any case yet and no jurisdiction. We've been talking to everybody to try to get some information, said Davis, owner of a bottling plant. We've called all their friends all over the eastern seaboard, and they have heard nothing. The girls, recent graduates of Monticello Junior College in Godfrey, Illinois, went to Ocean City last Tuesday and stayed at a rooming house. That's it. Uh, they telephoned the Davis home Tuesday and Wednesday nights. The girls were to join the Davis family Friday night to drive to Durham, North Carolina for the graduation of Miss Davis's brother, Wesley. All right. So you got that. Missing girl's car found in New Jersey. Yeah, so the girl's father saw three. Uh, the Perry's father, director. I think this is pretty much the same. The girls left the room. Okay, that's a little bit more in here. The girls' recent graduates of Monticello Junior College in Godfrey, Illinois, went to Ocean City last Tuesday and stayed in a rooming house. They telephoned the Davis home Tuesday and Wednesday night. The girls were to join the Davis family Friday night to drive to Durham, North Carolina, for the graduation of Miss Davis's brother Wesley. Now this has more on it. The girls left the rooming house at 4:30 a.m. Friday. So that's really, you know, I mean, 4:30 in the morning. It's dark outside. Um, Friday, uh, appearing cheerful, according to the landlord, and drove away in a 1966 Chevrolet convertible. They have not been seen since. Miss Perry's father, director of productions for the Beeman Bag Company flew here Saturday night to help in the search. Yeah. Yeah, it gets pretty weird stuff going on later, I can tell you that. Yeah, so those are the two girls right there. Okay, the bodies of two co-eds missing since Friday after uh, Friday, after an ocean beach vacation, were found Monday afternoon in a secluded underbrush off the Garden State Parkway near here. Thank you, Jessica Schubach. Yes, a reading wave would be awesome. The bodies identified as those of Susan Davis, 19. Uh, I think we've got this one. So. Susan... Well, I guess I could put that in there. 2805... La Laurel Lane Camp Reading Wave Newspaper. Hill PA. There you go. So this is where um, Susan Davis lives, right here. So that's where Susan Davis lives. I mean, that look, I mean, that's a classic 1950 type house right there, right? Thank you, Danielle. And Elizabeth Perry, 19 of Route 3, Excelsior, Minnesota. Uh, they were found partially decomposed. So now they're, they were found, right? They were found partially decomposed just inside the Egg Harbor Township border near mile 30 of the parkway. So, you know, go back over to, let's see, yeah, bodies found right here. Yeah, 
Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of stuff going on here. Hold on. Thanks, Cindy J and Daphne. Joining the reading wave. So the bodies ocean were wave, found. I think we're ocean on wave, ocean part wave, ocean wave. Highway, I mean, marker 30. Let's see. Yeah, let's see what that one is right there. <laughs> well, thank you, Caligal 3. Uh, that says 3. What'd they say? That says 31.9. So, uh, just inside the Egg Harbor Township border near mile 30 of the parkway. Yeah, I don't know. I think it was right there. I think they got. Well, we'll check that later, but I'm pretty sure. Thank you, Cali Gal 3. Look at that. We're at 62.8%. Reading wave fun smile. Okay, both girls were students at Monticello Junior College in Godfrey, Illinois. Yes, we're calling it murder. Atlanta County Prosecutor Robert N. McAllister said the bodies, one nude and the other fully clothed, so one of them was probably the target, were partially hidden under a blanket of leaves. The nude body was that of Miss Davis, he added. He said one of the girls had indentations in her stomach and that both of the bodies had markings on them. The prosecutor said the bodies were found at approximately 1.30 p.m. by Eldwood Fonse Jr. of the Parkway Maintenance Section 6. He said, he said Fonse made the discovery while searching wooded area near where the girl's car was found Friday morning. McAllister said the car, a 1966 Chevrolet convertible, was discovered at 8.30 a.m. Friday on the northbound side of the parkway by Avalon Barracks, uh, Trooper Louise uh, Stur, about 150 yards from where the bodies were found. The girls had stayed in the Simon House in Ocean City. Uh, Walter Simon, owner of the home, said they left at 4.30, so there's like a little hostel or, you know, hotel, whatever the hell it was. They stayed at the, uh, the Simon House in Ocean City, Walter Simon, owner of the home, said they left the home at 4.30 a.m. Friday to, quote, beat the traffic. McAllister said the car was abandoned on the parkway shoulder sometime between 7.30 a.m. and Friday when a trooper passed the area on a routine patrol and one hour later when the car was discovered the car was then towed to Blazer's gas station in Northfield said McAllister. Police apparently didn't connect the abandoned automobile with the disappearance of the two girls until Monday morning when Parkway maintenance men and police began a search of the area. McAllister said a jacket found near the bodies bore the name of Susan Davis, and he said the car's owner had been traced to Miss Davis. This, I mean, this is crazy. <laughs> the, 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 the stuff that you see in this case is weird. Uh, anyways, so that's them actually taking one of the bodies out of the woods. One body is taken from the shadowed foliage where bodies of two girls were discovered. Right? I wonder if that's probably the looks like a hearse there. They're gonna put it in the back. Callister said a jack. Okay, uh, the bodies were found at approximately 20 feet from each other, says Sergeant Cobus. One of them was lying face down and one face up. They were approximately 20 feet behind a fire break road, off the heavily travel traveled superhighway. Cobus said the bodies were partially hidden with leaves when found. Cobus said he believed the indentations appeared to be stab wounds, but would have to wait Tuesday you know, for the autopsy to confirm that. Police refused to speculate on a motive or possible suspects in the dual murder and would not even apply the term murder until after 6 p.m. The girls had arrived in Ocean City last Tuesday and stayed at the Simon House until their Friday departure. 
Do I have the Simon house here? Let's see. So Ocean City's over here. Yeah, there it is right here. So Simon house. I guess right there, actually. Right at this, somewhere right at this intersection here. Okay. So the girls arrived in Ocean City last night and stayed at the Simon House until Friday departure. A 13 state alarm has been issued for them and their fathers described as wealthy businessmen had rented a helicopter Sunday. The father's soft drink modeler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got that. Um, let's see. Arts degree. So Miss Davis had graduated from Monticello Junior College on May 25th and received the Associates of Arts degree. She was reportedly planning to attend Ithaca College in Ithaca, New York in the fall. Miss Perry reportedly had completed her freshman year at Monticello and was planning to return in the fall. State police officials were rushed to the murder scene by helicopter shortly after 2 p.m. and un a uniformed uh, troopers kept reporters well away from the scene until after the bodies had been removed. Be careful to hold on. Oh yeah, so let's see. Let me go to page seven really quick and then come back again. <laughs> I think it was up here. I remember looking at it. Uh, let's see. I saw the one at the top there. Okay, that's to be careful. Um, walk 10 or 15 feet of roped off murder area and troopers. Coba said the Captain Mario Patera Division of Headquarters would oversee the investigation. The area where the bodies were found was thick with Jersey scrub pine. So that's the scene again. Uh, police said Dr. Henry Seibel of Shore Memorial Hospital performed the autopsies. The parents of the victims arrived in Atlantic City by airplane shortly after 6 p.m. Okay, my wife told, told those girls, be careful, be careful. Walter Sybin, who owns a rooming house. See, here's where it is, 712 9th Street. So, 712 9th Street. Street, Ocean City. I think it should go right there. Oh, a little bit further up. Right. Although, that's just 9th Street right there, right? Oh, yeah. So I'll just leave it where it was. Because I must have, I think I probably figured it out later that would have been right here. Thank you, American lady. day and the girls so it said okay Walter E. Sybin who owns a rooming house at 712 9th Street here thus described the advice given to Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry at 430 Friday as they were leaving in their car for Miss Davis's home in Camp Hill Pennsylvania it was Memorial Day and the girls had earlier planned not to leave until 7 a.m. I was going to do the story for Memorial Day. <laughs> I was like, because it was right on it, right? Uh, who earlier planned not to leave until 7 a.m. decided that they might beat the holiday traffic by departing several hours early 
as Miss Davis planned to attend her brother's graduation at Duke University. Caligal 3 reading wave, ocean wave. Boom, thank you. They never reached their destination. Somewhere around daybreak, as they rode up the lonely Garden State Parkway near Summers Point, only a few miles from the Ocean City, they encountered their murder. The pair had made quite an impression on an er elderly Sybin and his wife, so the guy that owned the house, the girls impressed them, who meet many youngsters as they run rooming house for girls in the popular resort of teenagers. They were very nice and sophisticated. You could tell immediately they came from good families, he said. Very well bred, he said. <laughs> the girls were attractive, very plain in their manner. They also apparently became very fond of Simon and his wife during their three night stay at, at the rooming house. Simon indicated the feeling was mutual. They hugged my wife and kissed us goodbye. Well, that's pretty cool. He continued, the Perry girl told he, he and his wife, Simon, I love you for what you are. Let's see, the Perry girl told he and his wife, Simon said, I love you for what you are. Huh, sounds like cool people. I wish I could get girls like that all the time, Simon said. They were quiet and well behaved. The girl also promised to write and tell, tell when they arrived home safely, he said. They also promised to return to the rooming house if they ever returned to the resort. It was at that point, it's at that point that, which one was it? I think it was over here. Yep. There it is. It was at that point he said that his wife cautioned the girls to be very careful on their trip home. They replied, don't worry, and that if they got tired, they would just pull over the side of it to rest. They never had a chance to get tired as their trip abruptly ended less than 10 miles from Ocean City. Simon said he bought his rooming house four years ago and also runs a farm in Pennsylvania in the winter. He said he feels like selling his local place as a result of the incident. When you see something like this happen, it takes all the fun out of the business. Yeah. Uh, Hitch Hitcher sought in girls killing. So this is uh, Walter E. Simon. That's that guy, the owner of that store. Rooming house, 712 9th Street. A clean-cut hitchhiker who may have thumbed a ride Friday morning with two 19-year-old co-eds uh, later found stabbed to death alongside the Garden State Parkway near here became the object of a police search Tuesday. The man was described to state police as um, at Absecon Barracks by Albert Hickey, a special Summers Point patrolman who was on duty at the Point Diner on the Shore Road Circle until 4.15 a.m. Friday and lingered outside for a while afterwards. Hickey said he saw a dark convertible with two girls inside stop on MacArthur Boulevard for the hitchhiker sometime around or before 5 a.m. The description of the car was similar to that of the 1966 Chevrolet convertible in which Susan Davis of Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, and Elizabeth Perry of Excelsior, Minnesota, had left an Ocean City rooming house at about 4.30 a.m. The car was found about three miles from the circle off the northbound lane of the parkway Three miles from the circle. I wonder what that is. Let me say, so yeah. So there's the circle, right? Um, or maybe it's no. Maybe it's this one. That looks more like a circle. Wait, let's see how far that is. Hmm. 
that's 1.3. I don't know. Well, actually, it's up here. Well, no, it's three miles, though, right? So let's see. That's 3.1, so, I mean, I think that's right on the money there. I think that's exactly where it is. The script, uh, let's see. The car was found about three miles from the circle off the northbound lane of the parkway later Friday morning and was towed away by police order. The bodies of the two girls were discovered Monday about 150 yards from the spot where the auto had been found in a densely wooded area. The girls stopped and the hitchhiker ran up the side of the car. The girls stopped and the hitchhiker ran up to the side of the car. The girl passenger said something to him and then opened the door and let him in, in the back. The man, he noted, was of about college age, 5 feet 7, and dressed in yellow pullover shirt and dark pants. He carried a small satchel. He looked fairly clean cut, not like a beatnik or hippie, that's for sure, Hickney said. The car, which Hickney said he believed had Pennsylvania tags and might have been blue or black, then sped off down MacArthur Boulevard, which leads to the northbound entrance to the parkway. Hickey said he observed uh, is that on this one? He observed this is oh maybe over here. Hmm. That tracker and it says page four. What's this? Is this not page four then? Okay, two, three, four. Oh, maybe that was the problem. Uh, minor. No, that says, that says 16 up there though. So it might be missing that page. 12. Yeah. Oh, there's four right there. Hmm. Weird. The incident take place in front of the Jolly Roger. After uh, notifying the hostess, he would be outside. Let me go back. Have to go back a page now. What was the. Hickey said he had observed the incident take place in front of the Jolly Roger after notifying the hostess he would be outside in case she needed me. I'm trained to observe anything around my area, he said. That's one reason I looked that way. He also said that Miss Davis looked familiar from her picture, but that he might have seen her in the diner before. Police otherwise reported no further clues or information that might lead to the girl's killer. An autopsy performed Monday night by a chief state medical examiner, Dr. Edward Albino, revealed that Miss Davis... Daughter of soft drink bottler Wesley S. Davis died of a stab wound to the right side of the neck inflicted by a sharp instrument which perforated the larynx. She also had a stab wound on the left side of the abdomen. Miss Perry, according to the autopsy, died of a stab wound to, in the chest which penetrated the right lung. She also was stabbed in the chest and had wounds in the neck. Police said Miss Perry had not been sexually assaulted. Whether Miss Davis was assaulted in the manner was undetermined due to the decomposition of the body. A search of the area where the bodies were found Tuesday failed to turn up the weapon or anything of value. Hickey denied a report Tuesday that they had been called to break up a dispute allegedly involving the two murdered girls in the diner. Yeah. Let's see. Police also noted that an in initial error in a report they had received on the registration of the car found Friday had caused them to uh, not to connect immediately with the girls who were reported missing Sunday afternoon. 
A routine check had been made on the car, which was towed to the Blazer Auto Service lot. Uh, according to Sergeant Joseph Cobus, the report received from the Pennsylvania Motor Vehicle Division in Harrisburg was for a Pontiac belonging to another owner. It was not listed as stolen and subsequently classified as an abandoned car. Yeah, there, there's this one police officer who kind of, you know, they just went after him. I'm not sure if it, they thought maybe he was involved somehow, but yeah, so let me get to the next one. So now we're on the, you know, started on, first articles were June 2nd, now we're on, we're merely on June 4th here. So that says Hitchhiker's Sot. Let's just go to the next one. So June 5th. So here we go. Uh, a yellow sweatshirt belonging to an area man jailed Tuesday and disorderly was reportedly sent for police analysis Wednesday to determine whether it was stained with blood of two 19-year-old girls. Lieutenant James Brennan of the State Police Criminal Investigation Division said the garment's owner um, had been eliminated as a suspect in the double murder of Susan Davis of Camp Hill, uh, Pennsylvania, and Elizabeth Perry, Excelsior, Minnesota, whose bodies were, yeah, I mean, so it was eliminated, so I don't know what the, uh, the investigator also said the man was found wearing the shirt, you know, so it was, it was eliminated, so what, what point is it there to have an article on? Then on June 6th, a date, breakfast, and then murder. Okay, so now there's more information now. So at 1.50 a.m. Friday, May 30th, Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry told the owner of their hotel, the Simons, that they would be leaving early for Philadelphia. They told Harold Simon, operator of the Simon house, that they would be leaving to beat the traffic. Less than four hours later, they were dead in the thick underbrush of the Garden State Parkway. Their deaths touched off the most intensive manhunt in Atlantic County history. On Friday at 2 a.m. to 4 a.m., shortly after the two girls tell Simon they will be leaving early, they go out with two youths wearing blue jackets emblazoned with Greek fraternity letters. They presumably go to one of the dozen of youthful night spots that dot the liquor freak city and then at 4 a.m three pennsylvania youths so look how weird this is at 4 a.m three pennsylvania youths parked their car near mile 30 of the garden state parkway they are out of gas and go to sleep to wait await daylight and aid the two youths dating susan and elizabeth return them to their hotel room the girls prepare, this is at 4.15, so those two, those three students were on mile marker 30, right? Then at 4.15 a.m., the two youths dating Susan Elizabeth return them to their hotel room. The girls prepare to depart Ocean City for Philadelphia, where they will join Miss Davis's family for a trip to Durham. So now, it's get, now it gets kind of weird. Uh, yeah, so then, and then at 4.30 a.m., the girls leave Simon's rooming house. They are cheerful and enthusiastic about the 70-mile trip. At 4.30 a.m., as the girls depart from the boarding house, the same two youths, the two, the two guys that were dating them, uh, they were standing across the street. Susu, one of them yells. Susan and Elizabeth ignore the two men, wave goodbye to a watching Harold Simon, and drive off. They will drive out onto the Ocean City Bridge. Yeah, so let's see where that is. Ocean City Bridge. Yeah, see, I think this is the Ocean City Bridge right here, right? So the Simon, and that's, that's the circle that we were talking about. Three use out of gas. So maybe that is 
Okay. I don't know. We might have to adjust that other location. But here's that circle. And here is the Ocean City Bridge. Let me go down to Street View here. I might have to move those other pins if this is really what this is. So is this Highway 30 right here? Or I mean mile marker 30 and yes it is. Okay, so that is where the, the three youths were parked. Uh, they will drive out onto the Ocean City Bridge towards the traffic circle in Summers Point. That's the traffic circle there. Uh, 445, uh, 4.45 a.m., the pair arrive at the Summers Point Diner. So they actually made it to, when I say the pair, they made it to the Summers Point Diner, a modern busy restaurant packed to the door at dinner time and the late evening hours. They have driven almost three miles from their hotel. Then at 5.15 a.m., the girls are still inside the diner so where the hell is that diner? Do I have the diner on here? Oh, yeah. Look at that. See, I've even got that. So, I guess... Yeah, so they cross this bridge here, right? They go over the Ocean City Bridge. Then they go to the diner. I've got the times here. 4.45 a.m. They go into this diner right here, right? And then, at 5.15, they're leaving this diner. The girls are still inside the diner, preparing to leave. In the diner, they meet two youths who offer to pay their check. The girls accept the offer, and the $5 check is paid. They leave the diner. Then at 5.55 a.m., the girls are knifed to death, just past mile 30 of the Garden State Parkway, 200 feet from the road uh, in thick secluded underbrush. So I think I need to move this. So, I mean, I have this here. There must have been a reason I put it there, but let's just, the three youths are there. Now, yeah, see, I actually, yeah, let me remove that. And put the, I think the car was found down here also. Then the bodies. Hope I don't have to move this later. There might be a reason I put this there. Oh, okay. All right, you guys, let's get that juice flowing in here. You know what I'm saying? All right, the, the, uh, 555, the girls are knifed to death just past mile 30 of the Garden State Parkway, 200 feet from the road in thick secluded underbrush, 20 feet past a narrow fire break path. The time is determined by an autopsy performed three days later at Shore Memorial Hospital. Somewhere, somehow, between the diner and the lonely point on the parkway, the girls have met their killer or killers. At 6 a.m., the three youths in the parkway are still asleep. So those three kids at 6 a.m., they're still in that car, are still asleep, unaware that the two young girls have been murdered 300 feet ahead of where they quietly rest. Really? So the girls would have made this turn like this. So I guess we could say uh, how long how many feet is 300 now that's 300 feet so these guys must have been that's mile marker 30 I mean they would have had to come around yeah it's hard to say the 300 feet isn't that long so maybe they were parked underneath that don't know well, somewhere, somehow, between the diner and the Lonely Point Parkway. And this article is 1969. See how much better it is, writing and storytelling was back then? They get the information. At 6 a.m., the three youths in the parkway are still asleep, unaware that the two young girls 
have been murdered 300 feet ahead of where they quietly rest. The boys said they saw nothing and heard nothing unusual. At 7 a.m., the boys wake up. They see a 1966 convertible. It's top down ahead of them. Two of them get out of the car and one of them stays behind. The two hitch a ride and head for the nearest gas station. At 7.20 a.m., the two boys arrive at Weiss Esso Station in Cardiff across from Searstown. They give the proprietor $5 for a deposit on the gas gas can and they will bring back uh, bring it back to the <coughs> bring it to their stalled car there they are six miles from where their car is parked at 7 30 a.m trooper louise stir drives by mile 30 of the parkway he does not see either the empty convertible or the youth's tan mustang at 8 a.m the two boys return to their mustang so what's weird is is this guy just not paying attention or what, that cop? The two boys return to their Mustang and on the superhighway. They pour the gas into the tank and leave. At 8.15 a.m., Trooper Stir returns on, on to the murder scene as the first day of Memorial Week and begins. Uh, he sees the girl's car and investigates. It appears to him to be an abandoned automobile one of many the trooper will see that weekend. At noon, the Chevrolet is towed to Blazer's Garage in Northfield, where it will remain until the following Monday morning. Friday afternoon, a routine teletype inquiry is sent to the Pennsylvania Commonwealth. A parkway is an abandoned vehicle Friday morning. The girls students at the Monticello Junior College in Illinois had arrived in Ocean City last Tuesday and stayed at the Simon House before their Friday departure for Philadelphia. Their car was discovered on the parkway at 8.30 a.m. Friday by Avalon Trooper Louise Sturr, who said he had cruised the area at 7.30 and seen neither the girl's car or the tan Mustang with the sleeping youths. We believe that both cars were there when the trooper passed, said McAllister. See, I think they might think that he's a little bit, a little bit nervous of that guy, you know, the, 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 this officer. Why did he say that? Police said that the convertible top of the 1966 Chevrolet was down when the girls left their Ocean City boarding house and when they left the Summers Point Diner. McAllister said police have... Uh, have been unable to find anyone who saw the girls leaving the diner. Information states Police Lieutenant James Brennan described as vital. The prosecutor described the public as being very cooperative and urged anyone with possible information concerning the murders to contact the Absecon State Police. So that's pretty weird, man. <laughs> These guys just sleeping in their car right at the, up the street where two girls are murdered. Minute by minute timetables. This is another one. Actually, I think that's the same one that we just did. Uh, June 8th. Slain girls not typed for pickup. Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry were not the type of girls to pick up unknown hitchhikers the head of state police squad investigating their murders said Saturday from what I know about them it doesn't appear they would pick up someone they didn't know alright guys so here we are again on one of those nights where I'm reading and going over an interesting story but the interest level in terms of chatting the stream goal and everything just goes Uh, so that's what it feels like that everybody just wants to do the popular cases all right and I'm just if you guys want me to do that then that's what we're gonna have to do because uh, I, I you know, Thanks, I gotta make this worth it
appreciates your dedication to these cold cases. Well, thanks, Juniper, Tarot, and Medic. That's exactly right. That's what I was. I hope people are aware of that. Regardless of it being one of the really cool cases that everybody's talking about, I think these sometimes are more interesting because there's so much more detail. Okay. All right, anyways, uh, Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry were not the type of girls to pick up unknown hitchhikers. Thank you, American lady. Police remained for the ninth day with few clues to the killers of the two 19-year-old co-eds slain on Memorial Day in the underbrush off the Garden State Parkway. The intensive manhunt across South Jersey and Eastern Pennsylvania continued. A diner's quiz early Saturday morning. State police questioned scores of patrons in the Summers Point Diner in still another attempt to find witnesses who saw the two girls leave the diner shortly before their death. Four investigators spent more than two hours at the diner in a pre-dawn interrogation and showed diners uh, recent photographs of the two slain girls. Brenner said Saturday night, however, that police had no luck in the questioning and were uh, widening their search for the murder weapon. The girls were last seen alive at the diner shortly after they left an Ocean City vacation to join Miss Davis' family in Philadelphia. Brennan said inquiries at the diner were aimed at locating witnesses who saw the girls leaving in their blue 1966 Chevrolet convertible. The girls were found 200 feet off. Now it says milepost 31. See, now it's like, okay, wh which one is it? The girls were found 200 feet off the parkway just north of milepost 31. <laughs> okay, see, I knew it, man. Ah, shit. No, I don't even know where that one was. See, I think they made it here. That's what makes more sense. Because here is already 100 feet, and I think they were just driving. Ah, crap. Yeah. Is it right here? Yeah, just follow along, Cindy. You know, just like you, you want your kids to do in school, you know what I mean? Uh, let's see. Uh, let's get right here. I think there's a mar mile marker right here. I might have to move everything back again, including where the two kids were. Man, this always made more sense to me, too. That's 30.8. So if that's 30.8, then maybe like right there-ish. That's on the bridge. Hmm. How come that's not really there? Man. I don't know where I had it at mile marker one point. Yeah, maybe it's like right here to say that. There's one right up there. Let me see what that one says. That's okay, Cindy. You'll just have to go back and hit rewind. Uh, 31.2, well, that's 31 and a half miles. So they said near mile marker 31. So it's probably just before this bridge over here, though. Right over here. You, you never ans ask your question. Yes, they found their bodies. We've said that. It's been read about may maybe nine times now. That, yes, they found the bodies. 200 feet from the, the road. Their car was 300 feet in front of the other car with the three kids in the car sleeping, they say. Okay, that's all part of the story. Uh, 
Oh, God, my God, oh my God, oh my God. Oh, Jesus. So 30.8, so let's just say around this area right here, right here. Okay, so just before that little thing there. So now I gotta move all these back over there. I knew there was a reason. Right here, let's say, is the first car, the three youths. Then their car was 300 feet in front of that one. So let's get like, um, do the 300. There's 300 feet, so I'm right on that. Okay. Hey, thank you so much. <laughs> Juju positive. Thank you. And then they were found 200 feet, so probably here. I doubt these have been here. I mean, probably. I mean, it doesn't even look like those were there then. 1991. Yeah, so maybe one of those was there. Many whistles later. There's that, and let's just put the bodies were in the woods down here somewhere. I mean, this could be anywhere. I'm just guessing because they said around mile marker 31. Okay. Uh, slang girls not type for picnic or pickup, excuse me. So here here they are right there. Uh yeah, so the question people at the diner, the girls were found two hundred feet off the parkway just north of milepost thirty one. Miss Davis was nude. Miss Perry clothed. So that's Perry, that's Davis. The police officials said they have many persons questioned, have not been totally cleared. Uh, he said the boys... Okay, Brennan also said Saturday that Miss Davis had taken several pictures during their vacation, including some of Miss Perry and two male friends. He said the boys had been questioned and were not suspects. Police still have been unable to find keys to the car, found abandoned, the morning of May 30th and towed to a Northfield garage. The car remained in the garage until Monday, June 2nd, when police connected the automobile with a 13-state alarm uh, for the, uh, let's see, where was that? Oh, we got to go to another pit for the... Is this not the page? Oh, there. No? Youth loss and surf. Is this page two or? Yeah, it looks like it's page two. I'm probably skipping right over it. Oh, there it is. No, that's slain co ed hotline is set up. Ah, screw it. I'm not gonna. But there's so many more articles. I'm sure everything's in the. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Police divers scour creek for weapon in co-ed killings. Uh, the creek is a few hundred feet from where the two girls were, so we there is a creek here. Um, 
Let's see. And there's little, there's something right here. You know, I don't know if that kind of looks like could have been a creek back then. And there's one right here. here here's one, Mill Creek. And does it kind of keep winding around, or where does that, where does it go? Hmm. And this is back at mile marker. Mill Creek is, that's probably like 30 and a half, but it definitely could be right there. The bodies were found in a wooded area just off the northbound lane of Garden State Parkway in Egg Harbor Township near here. More than 200 persons have been questioned in connection with the crime. And that's them looking, probably found a huge hubcap there. <laughs> Man, Cindy, you're just, uh, you're going on and on. This has all been discussed in here already. Uh, let's see. Knife, keys found in slang. So there you go. I mean, look how crazy this is. They actually, murder probers here are awaiting lab tests of a small kitchen knife to determine if it may be the weapon used to stab two co-eds to death in a woods near Summers Point. The knife was found on the shoulder of the Garden State Parkway yesterday. Near the spot, two children found the girls' ignition keys late Wednesday afternoon. Both had apparently been tossed from a passing car or cars. Although police are officially, um, are officially saying nothing further than the knife and keys were found north of the Memorial Day murder scene, informed sources have placed the distance at about two miles midway between the woods and the Black Horse Pike. Okay, let's see. Uh, where's Black Horse Pike? Black Horse Pike. What are you talking about? Yesterday, near the spot. Mile midway between the woods and Black Horse Pike. Hmm, that doesn't make any sense. The knife reportedly was found by state troopers one-tenth of a mile from the Keys. Okay. Although police are officially saying nothing further. Uh, I want to read that again. Murder scene. Informed sources have, been pla have placed the distance at about two miles midway between the woods and the Black Horse Pike. God. Black Horse Pike is way up here I mean this is it an actual place oh that's okay no that's Black Horse okay there we go that's the name of this highway here so let's go all the way down okay so that's right here yeah Black Horse Pike right here and so they're saying about halfway. So somewhere the knife was found. So somewhere like right there. And the keys were found not too far away from there. <clears throat> Yeah, I know. I, I, I got it, Marlene. Did you see me find it on the screen there? Thank you. Uh, let's see. The knife reportedly found by the state trooper one-tenth of a mile from
from the keys bore no visible blood stains, according to Atlantic County Prosecutor Robert McAllister. He refused to speculate it may be the murder weapon, saying the 30-man state police task force here has sent several other knives to be checked out by the state police lab in Trenton. Investigators have sent at least a dozen knives to the lab in the past three days, according to State Police Sergeant Robert Saunders. At this point, none is more significant than another, the sergeant said last night. Uh, kitchen knife. But he added, the knife found along the parkway yesterday is the only small kitchen knife. The lab is... Uh, working on. It is also the only one found near the keys. The other range from pen knives to screwdrivers, da da da. After 10 days' search of everything within a mile and a half of the murder scene, and had reportedly turned up only a man's elaborate skin diver's wristwatch, police were led to the new search area yesterday by two children who happened to cross the ignition keys. The knife picked up by troopers was more carefully handled and may bear the killer's fingerprints. Miss Davis, 19, of Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, and her college friend Elizabeth Perry, also 19, of Excelsior, Minnesota, were murdered about 6 a.m. Memorial Day in a woods. That's interesting. I mean, 6 a.m. is light out, you know. But we know that they were alive later because it was 5.45 when they left that diner. They were brutally stabbed to death, and Miss Davis possibly raped. Makes you feel like somebody from the diner did this. Although police, and, but there's also those three guys in the car. But I mean, why did the girls stop? Did they ask the people for something like, "Hey, do you guys need help or something?" And then, you know. Although police have never officially pronounced the theory of the murders, the the proximity of the keys and the knife, it is, it is in fact, a murder weapon, play havoc with some unofficial theories. It is unlikely, the unofficial speculation goes, the killer was riding as a hitchhiker with someone if he took the opportunity to throw the two items from the car. But investigators here customarily are declining to speculate the killer might have his own car to flee the murder scene. Police do say they have been unable to find a motorist who might have passed the murder scene between 5.30 and 6.15 a.m. the day of the murders. The last time the co-eds had been placed alive is 5.30 a.m. when they walked by themselves out of the Summers Point Diner after breakfast. So, the, I mean, look, it's just a weird story because... You know, I mean, here, here, here's where they are. We're at the Simon house right here. Then they leave there. I think it was like 4.30 in the morning or something. Then they arrive here at 4.45. That makes sense, right? And then at 5.15, apparently they leave the diner. But now they're saying 5.30. They leave this diner here. And obviously they drove just like this straight up here. Get onto the freeway right at the... Uh, well, this is the circle they were talking about, and this is three miles from there. So I should have stuck with my own instincts before. Uh, anyways, they come up here like this and drove down, and somehow they're dead right over here. I mean, it's and there, but there was amazingly there was a car with three teenagers sleeping right here, and claimed they slept right through it as the car 300 feet in front of them had two women that were eventually walked into the woods and murdered. And, you know, <laughs> and then oddly, the killer, how did the killer get somewhere? He hitchhiked another ride from somebody and then threw those items out? Does that make any sense to anybody? Because the girl's car was right there too. Yeah, we, we know, Cindy. We know, we've been reading it. Man, you're driving me nuts, man. Are you doing this on purpose? Uh, 
Okay, anyways, uh, let's see. But investigators here customarily are declining to speculate the killer might have had his own car to flee the murder scene. Police do say they have been unable to find a motorist who might have passed the murder scene. Uh, the latest time the co-eds have been placed alive is 5.30 a.m. when they walked out by themselves out of the Summers Point Diner after breakfast. Autopsies have placed death within 20 to 30 minutes. Probably the food was still in there. No, I'm just grouchy with your... You keep asking questions that have been answered a thousand times, Cindy. Uh, well, you got to look at your own thing. It's like you're... You, I'm reading everybody's comments, but yours are sticking out. Uh, but the first passing motorist police have found, pa and I'm actually in a good mood, you know. Uh, but the first passing motorist police have found uh, passed the murder scene at 6.15 a.m. He and seven other motorists who passed between then and 7.30 a.m. have said there were only two cars parked between the parkway and the woods. The girl's blue convertible and a tan Mustang. The Mustang was a hundred yards from where the murders were committed, contained three Reading, Pennsylvania boys who claimed they sat there asleep from about 4 to 7 a.m. I mean, these two, these three kids are suspicious, you know, it's like, uh, I mean, did, were these three kids, did they follow them and get them to pull over somehow? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how that worked. The boys told the bizarre story of running out of gas, sleeping through the murders, then hitchhiking along the parkway to a Black Horse Pike gas station to get two gallons of gas at about 7.30 a.m. After giving the boys lie detector tests and checking their story, police last week called the three completely clear of suspicion. Now that the ignition key and possibly the murder weapon has been found along the boys' route to the gas station, then home, uh, now, that, now that the ignition key and possible murder weapon has been found along the boys' route to the gas station, then home, Prosecutor McAllister refuses to say if any or all the boys have been placed in a more prominent position in the investigation. Wow, so the key was and knife were found on the way that they would normally get home. Yeah. I could not comment on their prominence now. Tests on car. In addition to the knife and key, lab test results are also being awaited on the co-ed's car. Found near the murder scene, uh, found near the murder scene two weeks ago. The car impounded by state trooper as a routine abandoned car three days before the bodies of the missing girls were found was uh, trucked to the Trenton lab test Thursday. Official results are also being awaited on analysis of scrappings from under the co-ed's fingernails. The, scrape, er, the uh, scrapings, not scrap. <laughs> Although they have two P's, so isn't that scrappings? You know, I think scrapings has one like that. But see right there, C R A P, and then then it has the other one. Official results are also being awaited on analysis of scrapings from under the coed's fingernails. The scrapings were taken during the autopsies to determine if the coeds might have scratched some flesh during a struggle with their assailant. Teams of detectives are also continuing to check leads in South Jersey and Eastern Pennsylvania, police say. Yeah, I, I mean, I think people agree with you there, Cindy. You know, but, I mean, these three kids seem sort of... Like, what are the odds of that? But also, why would they sleep? Why would they leave their car there, too, all those hours? That seems kind of stupid. Uh, the spot where the keys and knife were found is believed to be near the pavement on the grassy shoulder of the parkway that runs to within 40 feet of the fire road, the main street of a scattered village called Bargain Town. Is that still there? Yeah. 
Okay, well, there's Bargain Town. So we're kind of close, right? I mean, I could move it, I guess. And maybe put it right there. Uh, there are about a dozen houses near the parkway at that point. Last night, workers, housewives, and children around the dozen houses are claimed to know nothing of where the keys were found or whose children found them. Police, for security reasons, are zealously guarding the identities of the children. But three women in Lily May's beauty salon, which sits in the clump of houses, pointed a reporter to the spot they saw troopers probing with what they said appeared to be a metal detector yesterday morning. The spot is an exact two miles north of the murder scene. Really? So. Let's see what the, where that is. That's 2.35. Yeah, that's two, that's two miles right there. So they were looking in that area also. I wonder, wonder what they were looking for. It's pretty weird. Thank you, Dan Keith. Hey, look at that. We're at 81.19%. There are about a dozen houses near the parkway at that point. Uh, last night, workers... Okay, let's see. But three women in Lily uh, Beauty Salon. The spot is an exact two miles north of the murder scene. All right. So that one's finished. Now we're on to June 17th here. A black car seen at murder site. Okay, and the investigation into a Memorial Day murders of two 19-year-old co-eds gained momentum Monday. As state police announced a search for the driver, an old black Pontiac scene parked in front of the slain girl's car. Oh, wow. So now there's some other the disclosure that a witness saw the Pontiac parked in front of the 1966 blue Chevrolet convertible belonging to Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry shortly before they were stabbed to death. See, Cindy, I think that throws a curveball into it now. Shortly before they were stabbed to death, led to renewed appeals from police for help from the public. State Police Detective Robert Saunders said that the witness was the same one who had seen a young man sitting in Miss Davis's car on the Garden State Parkway behind the Pontiac. The witness had told police he saw the man sitting at the driver's seat with one of the girls in the front seat, whoa, and the other in the back seat. Well, that's totally different. I mean, that's the announcement came after state police officials met in the Absecon barracks to discuss progress in the two week manhunt that has led investigators across South Jersey and eastern Pennsylvania. Police refused to comment on reports that they had narrowed their search for the killer to three suspects, one of them local. Saunders said the witness. Uh, gave police other information that we will not dis uh, disclose because it may jeopardize the case. The witness came uh, to the barracks and told police that uh, he saw the two cars traveling north on the parkway that morning between 5.30... Oh, wow, so they were sort of driving together. He told police that as he passed the murder scene, 
Near the Parkway Milestone 31, he saw a blue Chevrolet convertible similar to the one driven by Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry, whose bodies were found June 2nd. Police had revealed Saturday the witness saw a youth sitting in the victim's car. The witness re report filled a crucial time gap during the 45-minute period from the time Miss Davis and Miss Perry left the... Let's see. The Summers Point Diner to the time an aut let's see. Diner to the time an autopsy had ascertained their death. Miss Davis of Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, and Miss Perry of Excelsior, Minnesota were leaving in Ocean City vacation to join Miss Davis's family in, Pen uh, in Philadelphia. Present at the lengthy meeting in Apsicon Barracks, in addition to key officials in the investigation were Atlantic County Prosecutor Robert N. McAllister Jr. and Troop A Commander Captain J. A. Capani. Capani said that 33 policemen are now working on the investigation led by State Police Lieutenant James Brennan. Last week, the keys to the girls' convertible were found. They had been missing since the car was found by a state trooper the morning of the murders. Police also found more than a dozen knives in the South Jersey area. The knives and keys had been sent to the state police laboratory in Trenton for analysis. A dozen knives, Jesus. These people just throw knives out their windows? Experts to examine car and murder of two co-ed. State police disclosed Tuesday that none of the 12 rusty knives uncovered in the area is the weapon sought in the Memorial Day murders. Okay. Tests of the state police crime laboratories in West Trenton revealed that no human blood was found on the knives. Investigators here said that the knives were probably lost by fishermen or hunters. Experts at the crime lab are examining the girl's car for fingerprints in the continuing search for clues leading to the killer or killers. Meanwhile, there was still no word on tests presumably completed on the slain girls. Police disclosed earlier that they had new leads on the crime as a result of the test, but declined to reveal what was discovered for fear of prejudicing the case. The victims were found beaten, stabbed, and stripped of clothing. Um, near the creek, they were mysterious. What, what case is this one? Uh, new leads on the crime as a result of tests, but declined to reveal. Huh. Is this the same case? That sounds different than what they said before. Uh... The victims were found beaten, stabbed, and stripped of clothing near the creek. They were mysteriously murdered sometime after they headed to Pennsylvania following a vacation in nearby Ocean City. Well, one of them was apparently fully clothed, right? A police spokesman said today that one witness has disclosed that an old black Pontiac was seen parked in front of the girl's blue convertible. The bodies of Susan Davis, 19, of Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, and Elizabeth Perry, 19, of Excelsior, Minnesota, were found about 300 yards. I mean, maybe somebody just got in front of them and sort of waved them over, you know, and then he kills them, and then he gets back in his car and takes off. Doesn't that make a lot of sense? Make kind of easy, too, I think. A police official said the witness is the same one who told them that he saw a young man early Memorial Day sitting in the girl's parked car with Miss Davis in the front seat and Miss Perry in the rear seat. The spokesman said the information about the Pontiac is part of the original statement given investigators last week. Huh. A leather case containing the keys to the girl's car was found 
in the fields near uh, Pat Kong Creek. Oh, let's see where that is. Well, what, which one is Pat Kong? Oh, there it is. Pat Kong Creek. <laughs> it looks like more like a lake at this point. Yeah, I think the creek is no more. They probably built it into... I wonder if that was something... Let's see. Yeah, we can't really tell. I wonder if they, like, dammed it up and made a pond. Or maybe... So that's Maple Run. Maple Run. And maybe it runs out the other side of this. Like, what's this called? Yeah, there's a lot, a, lot, a lot of different stuff in that article there. So maybe Pat Con Creek is right there. Knife and car. So maybe, you know, who knows if they made a pond out of that or uh, dammed it up. Link sought in co-eds. Watch. State police still searching for... Hold on a second. They also, you guys, there's still some of the blue notebooks out there. If you want to buy those, send 25 to PayPal. You get the blue notebook, the blue pen, and the stress ball. Yeah, we always struggle on these reading nights. I know it's my fault because I do the reading, but everyone always says, Oh, I love the reading nights, Gray. I love the reading nights. Uh, let's see. Uh, the watch is believed popular among skin divers and surfers. Police are seeking information on persons who had a watch like the one found. We emphasize the word... Let's see. There goes my stomach. <laughs> I just drank a bunch of water. Is that page 7? No, it's 18. Hmm. 17? Yeah. I wonder how it skips so far like that. 7. That's three, so it looks like it's not there. Well, thanks, Juniper Terrett, but I think it makes people get, like, go to sleep. And like I say a million times, um, you, know, you know, part of what helps this channel go and everything is the funds that we bring in to support all the charities and everything like that. And whenever I do the reading, it just... You know, you, even though people like it or whatever, they can listen, it dramatically affects that. So it's one of those things where, you know, what, what do I do? Uh, suspect sees in co-ed murder. A 33-year-old Newark man was arraigned yesterday afternoon on charges of murdering a college co-ed in South Jersey. New Jersey State Police detective sees the suspect, Nicholas M. Mendez at his room in Newark boarding house. Uh, Detectives Frank Schoner and Robert Beckner, Becker of the uh, Mantua State Police arrested the suspect following a month-long investigation. I think they're the victim, Susan Davis, 19, of Campbell, Pennsylvania, and Elizabeth Perry, 19, of Excelsior, Minnesota, were stabbed. Uh, so it's just mentioning the two others. I mean, they don't know if it's related or not. Now, what the hell happened here? An 11-year-old girl accidentally hanged herself Saturday night when an apparent prank backfired. Sylvetta Hancock, the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Perry Hancock, 631, the girl had gone upstairs to prepare her bath a short while before and attracted attention by leaving the water running. Police said she apparently hid in the closet, placed a cord around her neck, intended to scare the person who found her, but lost her footing 
during the preparation? How do they know that was a prank? I think people just like to, it's relaxing and they go to sleep. <laughs> I mean, it's like everyone always says, hey, when you do the reading, people go to sleep. Yeah, it puts me to sleep. That's what Danielle always says anyway. Co-ed killers still at large, still track. Four thirty AM last Memorial Day, Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry checked out of the Ocean City rooming house where they spent the three previous days. The screen door of the Dutch colonial home creaked shut. Four hours later the two young women were dead, their bruised and bleeding bodies concealed beneath showers of showers of leaves and woods a hundred yards from Garden State Parkway. Today, nearly one year later, Ne uh, their murder is still at large. Today, the search for him, one year closer to success, clues provided by a similar double murder in West Virginia recently may bring to an, bring it to an end. Yeah. Uh, anyways, that's it. A month after that one, and this is 1970 now. Search continues for co-ed slayer. One year ago, two co-eds left the resort bound for home after a brief vacation. A short time later, they were murdered in a wooded thicket. Their deaths marked the beginning of one of the most intensive manhunts in South Jersey history. Today, dro droves of vacationers unwittingly drive past the patch of Jersey scrub pines on the Garden State Parkway where two 30-year-old girls died Friday, May 30, 1969. The victim, Susan Davis, of... I thought it was like June 7th, actually. No, oh, maybe not. The victim, Susan Davis, of Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, and Elizabeth Perry, of Excelsior, Minnesota, decided to leave Ocean City early that morning. Yeah, I think it, yeah, it is May 30th. To beat Memorial Day traffic, they had spent three days shopping and sunbathing and going to liquor-free night spots in South Jersey Resort Town. They planned to join Miss Davis' family in Camp Hill for a trip to Durham, North Carolina, where her brother was to graduate from Duke University. Susan and Elizabeth had met as students at Montecino Junior College, Godfrey, Illinois. Harold Seidman, owner of the rooming house where the girls stayed, and his wife bid them goodbye as the co-eds drove off in Susan's blue convertible. Be careful, be careful, my wife told those girls. Yeah. Uh, somewhere between the diner and the thicket, the co-eds encountered a man who stabbed them to death with a penknife. Unfortunately, a series of errors marred the police investigation of the crime. At 8.30 a.m. the same morning, the girls died. A state police trooper found their, abandoned, uh, found their car abandoned on the Garden State Parkway, since abandoned cars are not a novelty, only routine checking procedure was followed. The convertible was towed from the murder scene to an auto service lot and left there. Further delay resulted when a clerk made a mistake in checking the license number and subsequently reported that the license was issued to another Camp Hill resident. Susan and Elizabeth worried parents contacted Camp Hill and New Jersey police Saturday and rented helicopters. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, what, when, let's see. Police released composite drawing of a youthful white man who was seen by two witnesses near Davis's car around the time of the murder. One witness said he noticed a man behind the driver's wheel of the convertible as it was parked along the road. He said one girl was in the back seat and the other in the front seat. 
There was an old black Pontiac parked in a few feet ahead of the convertible, he said. To add irony to the case, three youths slept in the car only a hundred yards away from the murder scene the morning of the murder. They told police the convertible was not there when they ran out of gas, but when they woke, awoke two hours later, the strange car was parked ahead of them. Ah, so they did see that. They said two of them... Oh, wait. No, the convertible, yes. Okay. Um, police cleared these youths as well as the youths uh, at the Summers Point Diner. The girl's father, Wesley Davis, a soft drink uh, bottler, and Ray Perry, da 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 uh, Yeah, so there's nothing, nothing new there. Okay, and this one is... State troopers faces rules violations. So they, they just went hard after this trooper here. A state trooper who, was found, who found the abandoned car of two teenage girls murdered near here last year will be in court, uh, court uh, will be court-martialed Tuesday at the State Police Administration Building. Uh, trooper John Sturr, uh, they spelled it differently, S-T-U-R in one of the original ones, of Linwood is charged with violating state police rules following his discovery of the abandoned auto on May 30, 1969. Sturr's court-martial will not be open to the public. The charges against Sturr allege that he failed to report having the car towed off the parkway, did not report a call from the Ocean City Police. He's also the one that said he didn't see the car there. What do you think of that, Cindy? Don't you remember he's the one that said he didn't see the car? See, it makes you wonder, I mean, you know, did people suspect that maybe he did something, had pulled them over? I mean, we do have the, the black Pontiac, but he said he didn't see them when he drove by, but then he saw them later. But he, you know, they were there when he, they even said in the paper that they suspect the car was there when the trooper drove by. He just didn't see it. So you wonder if they suspect him and they're charging him with this stuff to kind of put some pressure on him because it just seems like they just keep going on and on and on and on over and over. It says, um, cop called derelict in co-ed case. See, see that it says, a state police court-martial opened here yesterday against an officer involved in investigating the still unsolved knifing murders of the two socially prominent co-eds at the shore on Memorial Day 1969. All right, so I got about eight more of these articles to go, but if you guys can help get to the goal, we are, it's only $48 remaining to get to the Knights goal. That would be freaking awesome. All right. All right. A state police court martial opened here yesterday against an officer involved in investigating the still unsolved knifing murders of two socially prominent co eds Trooper John Sturr has been accused of failing to follow official procedures after he found a car later traced to Susan Davis of Campbell, Pennsylvania, one of the murdered girls. The bodies of Miss Davis and Elizabeth Perry of Excelsior, Minnesota, were found nearby. Both were 19. I know, isn't this a really interesting one here? It's crazy. Stir is accused specifically of failing to report having the car towed away and failing to issue a teletype message asking that the owner of the car be notified. The girl's distraught father hired a helicopter to view the area from the air for a possible a wreck while reportedly their daughter's car was in a local garage. All right, okay, so yeah, you're looking around. The court martial was secret and no details about it were made public other than that Captain Carl Clue, commanding officer of the Garden State. No takers, no takers. Uh, I'm not sure. 
That's a different case there. Uh. All right, there it is. Troop of which Stir was a member testified. The two girls, both daughters of prominent business executive, had spent the holiday weekend in Ocean City before heading back for Miss Davis, Pennsylvania home. Hey, thank you so much, Donna D. All right. Only about 30 left. <laughs> uh, very cool. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Oh, man. Every time I sit here, this stupid... When allergies come around, we might actually cut down this massive tree in our front yard because it just, it like dumps bucket of that yellow pollen all over the house. It's horrible. Thank you, Donna D. There it is, 89%. Uh, very kind, very kind, thank you. Yeah, so he had to, this guy had to go to trial and shit. I mean, it's certain. I don't know if it led to any. I mean, he. I think he got charged, and then they had to take it away at one point. Oh yeah, no. Th this is there. It is right here. So, so here's uh, what's going on. The case of the broken tele. Is that the one? Teletype machine. Is that it? Yeah, right here. The machine, the same one Stir is accused of failing to use in the initial stages of the case of the murders of two co-eds 18 months ago on the Garden State Parkway has been replaced along with all the other teletype machines um, at a cost of $25,000. So it's, this is kind of like the trial. Teletype becomes crucial in probe of teacher. During the cross-examination when it was pointed out that Stir said in a written report that the teletype machine was broken, Clue reported said he knew that the troopers are quite often deprived of teletype service because of teletype service because it was in such bad condition. He reportedly testified that as a result of that unreliable service, I attended a meeting with the Parkway Commission and prevailed upon them uh, prevailed upon them to spend twenty five thousand dollars for the teletype. I don't know. It's just such a weird thing that they just keep going and going after this guy over and over and over. I mean, look at um, co-ed case, no decision on trooper. The case of the state trooper charged with improper conduct in the Memorial Day murders of two co-eds in 1969 is still pending. I bet you there were some investigators that were curious about him, I think. Yeah, I could see why the parents could get angry too. I mean, they spent all that money on the helicopters when the vehicle's right there. And also, how come the, the trooper didn't say, oh yeah, you know what, I had this car towed there. I mean, it didn't cross his mind. I mean, uh, there has been no disposition in the matter. The spokesman disclosed yesterday, Stir still on the job as a trooper on the Garden State Parkway pending disposition of the investigation was the officer who found the car used by Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry before their bodies were discovered in dense underbrush near Ocean City. He is charged. I wonder how they were able to like trace back where her car was exactly. You know what I mean? Like they should have left the damn car right where it was. That probably would have helped something out. I mean, they didn't have GPS coordinates back then. Here it is, another one. Um, Trooper suspended. <laughs> God, man. New Jersey State Trooper John Elster on Wednesday was found guilty of violating regulations dealing with disposition of the abandoned car involved in the unsolved slayings of two co-eds in Summers Point. Stir was suspended without pay and allowances for two weeks. McGahan charged superior officers on the force had been 
Uh, officers on the force had used the hearing of Stir as a vehicle to cover up their own failure and place the blame on the man at the bottom of the totem pole. Stir 41 is attending a state police school and was unavailable for comment. McGann said he has not had an opportunity to discuss the verdict with Stir. The decision was announced Friday. Stir's suspension is effective May 22nd. Uh, uh, Trooper's lawyer to appeal suspension in murder case. He was court-martialed. Yeah. Then I think he actually, I looked him up. He was still doing something in law enforcement later. So, I don't know. So... You know, one, one of the things that's interesting is there's people that think that these two girls were one of, were Bundy's victims, if you can believe that. I mean, everybody's Ted Bundy's victims, right? But, I mean, there's been mul there's multiple articles about it. So here's one in 2019. I mean, the facts in that case are pretty weird, don't you think? This is an installment of my ongoing unconfirmed case study series. All of these cases have been connected to Ted Bundy in some way, whether by active investigation or later speculation. Well, speculation connections aren't really connections, right? But never officially linked to them. As they are still unsolved, generally police will not release the case files. However, using newspaper archives and other works for reference, I have written the most exhaustive summary of each case as I can. I also include my own analysis based on my research. So this is just... So on Friday, May 30th, 1969, Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry, both 19, were stabbed to death by an unknown assailant near Summers Point, New Jersey. The young women had been staying in Ocean City on vacation since Tuesday before 4.30, at 4.30 a.m., they were headed back to Pennsylvania in the hopes of beating the traffic, but stopped to have breakfast at Summers Point Diner. After leaving the diner, about an hour later, the, sub the sequence of events leading to their deaths is uncertain. A state trooper found their powder blue 1966 Chevrolet convertible abandoned by the parkway around noon that day and, it, and had it removed. Three days later, at about 1.30 p.m., the bodies of the two young women were found hidden under piles of leaves and dense woods. 200 yards from the Garden State Parkway and about 150 yards from the abandoned car. Davis was nude and her clothes were found in a pile near her, near her, uh, including her jacket and purse. Perry was clothed except for her underwear, which was missing. Uh, contemporaneous news reports vary on whether the victims were sexually assaulted some state that Perry had not been raped, while no determination could be made for Davis. Other reports indicated that both bodies were too decomposed to make a determination, and still, I mean, they, how, how come they were so decomposed so quickly? I mean, they were found not too long after they... Yeah, we saw that picture right there. The coroners did find that they had eaten breakfast about an hour before they were murdered and gave the time of death to be approximately 6 a.m. One of the victims had, had victims had been tied to a tree with their hair. What? I, we didn't see that in the paper. One of the victims had been tied to a tree with their hair, an unusual method of restraint. Huh. Both had been stabbed to death with a small knife, possibly a pen knife or pocket knife, Though the murder weapon was never found, Perry died of a penetrating stab wound to the right lung. She also had three stab wounds in her abdomen and side of her neck. Davis died of a wound in her neck and cut in her larynx. She also had wounds on her left side of her abdomen and a non-fatal wound on the right side of her neck. Due to the neck wounds, investigators said he theorized the killer was at some point in the back seat of the convertible jabbing at Davis as she was as she drove in order to force her to pull over police found a men's diver style watch without a wristband near the scene believed to belong to the murderer yeah we read about that 
The car keys were found ten days later tossed to the side of the road a short distance away from the bodies. Robbery was unlikely motive in the victims uh, as the victims' purses still had money in them and their suitcases were not disturbed. Staff saw two young men dining with the victims at the Summers Point Diner, but when questioned, the men swore they did not leave together. However, one of the witnesses at the restaurant said he saw two young women in a convertible pickup are picking up a young man of about 20 carrying a duffel bag and wearing a yellow sweatshirt. So what about that black Pontiac who appeared to be hitchhiking? The 18-year-old hitchhiker was quickly identified by police after acting suspiciously in Philadelphia. The 18-year-old the hitchhiker was quickly identified huh, by police after acting suspiciously in Philadelphia and admitted to having been in Ocean City the previous week. During questioning, the young man described taking a bus to Ocean City the previous Thursday and hitchhiking back to Philadelphia Friday morning, the same fra time frame as the murders. He flunked the polygraph test, gave fuzzy answers to crucial questions, and made odd statements about visions. He uh, had about two girls driving a convertible, and I was in the back, and their hair was blowing in the wind. Despite his circumstantial evidence, police were unable to place him at the scene, and he was ultimately released on lack of evidence. Huh. Hey, thanks, American lady. Yeah, we're almost there, you guys. Almost there. Boom chakalaka. Oh, you got it to exactly 2.30. Yep. Coed's car parked. Oh, so that's actually the car in the... Uh, probably the impound lot there, right? I think I did see that somewhere. Uh, three young men sleeping in their car, which had run out of gas, along the parkway saw the girls' convertible about 200 feet away around 7.15 a.m. when they awakened that morning. They hadn't witnessed uh, they hadn't witnessed it parked. Clear to suspects the teens did not report hearing any screams. Two witnesses came forward uh, to state uh, they had seen a lanky, slender teenager with curly brown hair, a narrow face, and sunken cheekbones. That kind of sounds a little bit like Bundy, right? In a white t-shirt lingering near the abandoned car the morning of May 30th at about 8 a.m. However, the police cautioned, we're not sure if this, if this is the murder. He was simply seen near the car. Later in the summer, a composite sketch of this suspect was released. The case went cold until a new lead surfaced in 1980 when serial killer Gerald Stano was arrested in Florida and later eventually confessed to the crime, calling it his first murder. He confessed to 41 total murders on the East Coast and often stabbed his victims without sexually assaulting them. New Jersey police sent two detectives down to Florida State Prison to interview him in 1982, and he signed a confession, but he had the murder, let's see, but he had the murder taking place on the wrong side of the parkway and got all the details wrong. Detective Sergeant Robert Mulholland said about the confession, at this point, we don't believe he's our man. I'm not, I'm not convinced at all. Homicide detectives said Stano often exaggerated his record of killing, thinking the resulting investigations would indefinitely delay his execution or give him uh, more attention and better treatment. Hey, welcome, Sherry Binez. He was eventually executed in Florida in 1998 for another murder. Inspired to come forward after hearing Stano and had wrongly confessed to the crime in May of 1983, a new witness surfaced who claimed to have seen a young man in a yellow sweatshirt who was definitely not Stano, walking along the road in question the day of the slayings at about 6.30 a.m. 
When the suspect saw the witness coming, he ducked into the bushes. The witness easily picked the suspect out of a series of photographs and chose the same young hitchhiker in the yellow sweatshirt who had originally been questioned and released back in 1969. The unnamed man was living in uh, Norristown, Pennsylvania and worked as a long-haul truck driver. In December 1983, that unnamed suspect was again cleared when the county prosecutor's office did not move forward with charges again, citing a lack of evidence. Huh. That's interesting. Uh, shortly after Bundy's execution in January 1989, forensic psychologist Art Norman contacted the New Jersey State Police claiming that Bundy had confessed the New Jersey murders to him on October of 1986. Hey, thank you so much, Jessica Schubach, and boom! We got to the goal, everybody. Amazing. You guys are awesome. Thank you very much. Jessica Schubach. Thank you. Oh, that's a pretty good uh, article here by something like, Hi, I'm Ted Blanc. <laughs> so anyways, uh, shortly after, it's cool too because all the stuff we've read is sort of intertwined in this thing. Uh, shortly after Bundy's execution in January 19th, forensic psychologist Art Norman contacted the New Jersey State Police claiming that Bundy had confessed the New Jersey murders to him in October of 1986. He presented them with a tape recording wherein Ted talked about his time in on the East Coast in 1969. Ted explained to Norman that around that time he was getting more into violent pornography and had been visiting the flesh shops along 42nd Street in New York City, Ted said, on the 1986 tape. Talk about being pushed to the edge with the most sophisticated, explicit pornography available in this country. Here he began speaking in the third person. He decided to take a little bit of a jaunt to what they call the shore, the Jersey Shore. This is early summer, so after being more or less detached from people for a long period, didn't have any friends, didn't really go anywhere, just more or less, had school and then sort of entertained himself with the porno pornographic hobby and drove the shore and watched the beach and just saw young women lying on the beach, you know, it's like an overwhelming kind of vision. He, he evidently found himself tearing around that place for a couple of days and eventually, without really planning anything, he picked up a couple of young girls and ended up with the first time he'd ever done it. So when he left the coast, it was not just getting away, it was more like an escape. Norman said neither woman was sexually assaulted, unlike subsequent Bundy victims, because he was overwhelmed by the magnitude of the crime. It was quite a wild scene. That's why it was very important because it was a, it was a start. <laughs> That's crazy. Whether Norman inferred this or Bundy directly stated it, it's unclear. I'm convinced he did it, Norman said. And I believe it was the first two murders that he got into. He had no reason to lie to me, and if he was lying, he had been saving this information for 20 years just to con somebody. Or, is this just an amazing coincidence that he just happened to be there on Memorial Day before he went back? And that's kind of what Bundy would do. Charm girls, you know, like, he might have, who knows how he worked it. So I guess the black Cadillac thing is sort of out of the picture. I mean, that sort of just disappeared. Huh, look at that article right there. That's a 1989 article saying psychologist says Bundy Reign of Terror started with 69 Parkway slangs. Huh. He just happened to be there Memorial Day. That is an amazing coincidence then. I don't think he had a little book of crimes that he knew about 
that he could use to throw his psychologist off. And guess what? Bundy would beat people to death. And that's what those later articles said, right? We just read that a little bit ago. Everything else he told me has been borne out. So why should he lie just about that? I believe it's important to note here that Bundy was incarcerated with Gerald Stano on Florida prison's death row at the same time as when police were questioning Stano about his crime. And, uh, I see. Uh, Ted Bundy and I hunt for the Green River Killer by Robert Keppel. Bundy explains that he was able to read some of Stano's confession documents. I last was with Jerry. We were both on death watch as a matter of fact, together as we also lived in the same wing together for some time. I read a very confidential report, a present tense report prepared by some state agency. It went into great detail about his confessions and his past life. And so getting to know Jerry was fascinating. Because he tell he tell me stories about things that happened, and then I'd read that something else had happened in the police report. Now this just goes on and on and on. Uh, let's see. Well, let me, there's actually a couple more articles in here. I'm just going to skip to those. 2021. Yeah. So here's a 2021 article. In Memorial Day 1969, a pair of 19-year-old junior college friends left a vacation home in Ocean City around 5 a.m., stopped for an early breakfast at the Summers Point Diner, and then disappeared. Their bodies were found three days later so I don't know how they could have been so decomposed. I mean, I know it was summer, but... Three feet off the Garden State Parkway at mile, mile marker... Hey, look at that, 31.9. So now it's like... I think I'm right on that, you guys. Hold on. I think I was like 31.8. Right, let's go this way. I think 31.9 is that bridge. So that bridge or whatever probably wasn't even there at the time. Here, let me go back this way. Is that a is that one right there? Hold on. No. Huh. Well, that's where the knife was. Okay. Not sure why I'm over here. It's over here. This is where I was trying to get. So let's see. It says 31.9, right? Yeah, there's one right here. Now, would they say 31 or what'd they say again? Let me read that again. Uh, 200 feet. Or, yeah, now it's 31.9. This is 30.8. So now, do we have to move everything again? I think it's. See, this feels like it's more correct, though. But maybe. Shit. I mean. <laughs> Let me go, this is the wooded area, see? That might be, that's what they're talking about. Let's see. 
Oh, there's 31.6. So probably maybe like right there. There's one, one coming up here. There it is, 31.9. I almost feel like I need to switch it to this because you know, this is like a recent article. But man, look at the difference there. Now the knife is found here. And there's the creek. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. See now, look at, there's a creek here now. That sucked, the newspapers had it all wrong. What is this thing? Huh. All right, well, I'm gonna move all these over. Bodies are found in the woods. The car is found. Basically, right there. On the side of the road, probably. And this one is not there. Then you had the three youths here. Utes. The three Utes. Just parked down right in front of them. I mean, crazy Looney Tune stuff there. All right. Okay, well, that sounds like we're a little bit more, we got dialed in more. This is a really specific 31.9. Now, maybe they meant 30.9, right? Because then that's close to the 31 that other people said. Can you quit typing in culvert, Cindy? It's just, you know. Anyways, the slaying of Susan Davis of Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, and Elizabeth Perry of Excelsior, Minnesota have never been solved. The investigation has carried on for a half century, crossing several states and in a window into New Jersey brushes uh, with two prolific serial killers, Ted Bundy and Gerald Eugene Stano. Bundy, who stalked most of his victims in the western United States, before his eventual capture in Florida, spent part of his childhood on the East Coast. You know what's weird is Cindy is, very, is so similar to Zozo. I think that's why it, it's like she, he, she types in those same types of things over and over again. <laughs> I just figured it out. <laughs> Bunny would have been finishing his lone semester at Temple at the time Davis and Perry would have taken their last vacation. Isn't that wild? And what if the, wouldn't that be crazy if um, Koberger also killed a couple people in Pennsylvania, like that lady, you know, as his first before he went to um, Washington State, right? Wouldn't that be weird? Just uh, again, remember. Bundy was in Pennsylvania first, then Washington, just like Koberger, Pennsylvania to Washington. Oh, God. Right. Now you're trying to brown those, Cindy. It doesn't work. i got to remove those. They were so brown nosy, they're scary to read at this on the screen. Wow. Um, let's see. Let me go to 2A here. Uh, not there oh there it is okay Bundy was executed in Florida in 1989 after being convicted of the murder of two Florida State University students Margaret Bauman and Lisa Levi as well as another victim 12 year old Kimberly Leach of Lake City Florida Richard Larson uh, author of the Bundy biography the, the, the deliberate stranger said Bundy once claimed credit 
for over 100 killings and that Perry and Davis killings bore the hallmark of Bundy's style. The trail remained cold after Bundy's death despite purportedly incriminating statements by two charismatic uh, by two charismatic Bundy by the by the char- charismatic Bundy as he wasn't the only killer who claimed he killed the women. Christian Barth, 55, an attorney who lives in Connecticut but practices in New Jersey, has written two books on the Davis and Perry murders. Uh, He spoke with the press shortly before the recent anniversary of the death. His first title, The Origins of Infamy, is a fictionalized account. The second, The Garden State Parkway Murders, a cold case mystery is fact-based. A Camden native who grew up... See, uh, in a moment, uh, Zozo's going to type in culvert. Watch. What happened to Charisma's comment? Where'd it go? Yeah, anyways. Um, his first title, The Origins of Infamy... Well, you would you almost typed it in, but there goes Cindy again. So. A Camden native who grew up in Cherry Hill, Barth, said that he first heard about the killings when he was 12 or 13, already several years after the fact. On a fa- Wait, what's going on here? His first title, The Origin of Infamy. A Camden native who grew up... Okay, he, the writer heard about this. The question struck him just as it has confounded untold investigators in decades since the slayings, which remain under investigation. New Jersey State Trooper John L. Sturr found Davis's blue Chevrolet Impala convertible at 11.50 a.m. Friday, May 30th, 1969, around six hours after the women went missing. Police said at the time, mistakenly believing it had simply been abandoned. Sturr had the car towed. We went over all that. The tag was either given or received incorrectly. New Jersey State Police Detective Sean Clark, the current lead investigator on the case, told the press in a recent interview. The vehicle came back as not stolen, and Sturr decided to impound the vehicle at that point. That would have been common practice, Clark said, especially if an ostensibly abandoned car is in prison traffic, is in prison, no, is impeding traffic or too close to the roadway itself. The Chevy was not immediately identified as Davis's un, uh, until after police from Ocean City issued a missing persons report in 13 states. The manhunt began that Monday, three days after the pair disappeared. Shortly thereafter, a parkway maintenance worker who was helping in the search, found the bodies 150 yards from where the car had been left. Davis had died of a neck wound that cut her larynx, according to Dr. Edwin Albano, then chief medical examiner. That was one of the first few articles that we read. But why'd you delete it, Uh, Charisma? What did it say? Oh. Really? So the show would suck if that they weren't in the chat, Charisma? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Man, why, why do the show then? You know, it's like, you know, to me it's exactly the same when I do the show. There's no difference to me. Yeah, that would be, it would just be so unfun, the show, if they weren't here. Boy. <whistles> wow. <laughs> no way. Let's see. Davis had died of a neck wound that cut her larynx, according to Dr. Edwin Albano. Both women had wounds on their abdomens and neck. necks. Davis was nude, her clothes piled next to her while Perry was closed though not wearing underwear. The autopsy report... Well, no, I, I think... I, I, I disagree with what Charisma said. Okay. Yeah. 
100%. Um, the autopsy report did not state whether they had been sexually assaulted, but state police are investigating the murders as sex crimes. I'm not even sure what, you, what that even means, Charisma. Show is great, but it's true crime. Is true crime fun? What does that have to do with anything? I don't know what that means. I what does that even mean, Marlene? Yeah. I don't even know what any of you guys... I, I can't make out anything you're saying. Whew. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's, it's so fun. Sometimes the chat doesn't even move. The autopsy report did not state whether they had been sexually assaulted, but state police are investigating the murders as sex crimes. Yeah, I mean, like, Bundy sometimes didn't sexually assault anybody, but he, he pounded them and killed them. But it's still probably sexually, there's some sexual element to it. Um, and whatever happened to them, it could not have been long after they left the diner at approximately 5.45 a.m. According to the medical examiner, they digested food approximately 20 to 30 minutes prior to being killed. Yep. Davis and Perry had plans to meet Davis' family in Camp Hill. The group then planned to travel to North Carolina for Davis' brother's college graduation instead. The girl's father and Davis' mother flew to New Jersey to identify their daughter's body. Uh, Davis's father, Wesley Davis, told reporters at the time he had immediately suspected foul play. Let's see, is Ted Bundy connected? I'm going to go down to this part right here. <laughs> well, what's wrong with you, Jeff? Jesus. <laughs> where, where are you coming from, man? You're, you're, are you drinking tonight, Jeff? It's it's Sunday. Get ready for tomorrow. All right. Yeah, we'll just move, remove. He hadn't made one comment all night, so let put him on timeout for the rest of the show. You guys, hey, hey Marlene, you mind if I just go through this stuff? You know, we've been going through the whole case, and you notice how the whole show got derailed. Just recently, okay? So, got to ask yourself that. Whether Bundy killed Davis and Perry... Wh whether Bundy killed Davis and Perry remains an open question. Investigators say they have not conclusively linked him to either killing. They haven't ruled him out either. After Bundy was executed in Florida in 1989, a psychologist who had worked with him until 1987, Arthur Norman told Atlantic uh, County investigators that Davis and Perry had been Bundy's first victims. Norman did not tell reporters that Bundy explicitly confessed to the murders, but rather that details of Bundy's account of his crime in the area in 1969 led Norman, Norman to conclude that Bundy had killed Davis and Perry. Then Atlantic County Prosecutor Jeffrey S. Blitz disputed Norman's revelation, saying at the time that Norman had drawn conclusions beyond what Bundy had actually told Norman. Blitz said there was no evidence to corroborate the claim. But Bundy, while studying at Temple, had been in the area around the time of the killings. His grandparents had at one point had a home in Ocean City, where he visited as a boy. See, there you go. Now he's familiar with the area. Uh, Bundy, however, wasn't the only one implicated in the murders. Gerald Eugene Stano, another serial killer, and Bundy's neighbor on death row was also considered as a suspect. Stano was born in Schenectady, Schenectady. <laughs> Man, that's hard to read that. Schenectady. New York. He implied he had been active in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, according to police in Florida, where he was eventually captured. Barth said the killings were more Stano's style than Bundy's. Bundy 
Barth said, didn't typically use knives. Yeah, that's one of the things I was thinking. Uh, I mean, it's Bundy used, used to just beat women to death with like a, a, you know, some item that he found at the scene. Yeah, say Schenectady three times quick. I could, if Plato was here, she'd say, I could do it, Gray. Yeah. When Gerald would murder his victims, he would often pile their clothes neatly nearby. They were close-up stabbings, Barth said. He was, of course, in the area, as well as questioned by New Jersey State Police along with other suspects. Clark confirmed that Stano had also been a suspect and, like Bundy, had not been ruled out but also not convincingly linked to the killings. Stano also claimed credit for dozens of killings over 40 years, his own exec execution in 1998, before his own execution. Authorities considered other possible suspects over the years. Still, nobody has been charged in connection with the killings Bundy and Stano were considered suspects, and I'm not saying we ruled them out, but there's just no evidence for us to connect the dots to the crime with them at this point. Serial killers can also be serial liars, taking credit for other crimes or simply making them up. What's that one guy's name again, you guys? What's the one guy's name? Remember the guy with the, uh, shit, now I can't even remember. Oh yeah, the, the guy that claimed about a thousand different murders and he, he probably did, yeah, Lucas, there we go. Yeah, Henry Lee Lucas. He probably did one murder and he claimed to do about a thousand of them. Yeah, I just said that, really, yeah. And so the case, uh, we, that's right, you guys are on rewind. Yeah, I'm going to remove Cindy's there. Always a follower of everybody else. Yeah, let's see. And so the case has remained cold. Uh, stir face, suspension over his rule. Yeah, so he got suspended. Serial killers can also be serial liars. Um... I've never seen an investigation this in depth, Clark said. There were 2,200 interviews conducted in this investigation throughout the course of its. Wow, that's a lot. So you got that one. And. Did Ted Bundy's murder spree begin with two college girls? So this is Oxygen. They must have had a show on it or something. But, you know, he kind of looks like, uh, you know, when he was really young back then, he looked more like a college student. So maybe he was one of the people there. Who the hell knows? Yeah. So all these links are in the description if you want to go check them out. I think I'm, I think I'm uh, done for the evening. <laughs> been three hours and four minutes uh, but didn't you guys think that was pretty interesting yeah I thought it was besides all the distractions that seem to always come Yeah, a lot of, everyone says they love this kind of stuff, but you can tell it's... Uh, let's see, let me get to that. Open that up. Yeah, like there's only 215 people watching. and yeah. All right, so thanks to Annie T, Traveling Teresa, K. Me, Laconic, Georgina Stoliker, uh, Kit Kat, Your Gypsy, Kathy Frydenmaker, Alley Cake, Jessica Schubach, uh, American Lady, Traveling Teresa, Music Maker, Cali Gal 3, Jessica Schubach again, Shine On You, Crazy Danielle, 
then Cindy, Daphne, Callie Gal 3, American Lady, uh, Junipers, Tarot and Magic, American Lady, Juju Positive, Dan Keith, Donna D, American Lady again, and then Jessica Schubach again, getting it to the the goal net. No, well, they said that they were murdered where they were found. Yeah, yeah, that was in the articles that we read. All right, uh, we're gonna do. I'm gonna spin from the last two nights here, even though like tonight wouldn't have made it, but I'll, I'll add it to the yesterday, and we'll see what happens. All right, this is for two nights here. We'll just do. Uh, I'm gonna spin here, see what happens. This is for one of the notebooks. Let's see what happens. Who knows? Look at that. Ash runs wild if you're out there. Ash runs wild. You get the notebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yay, freaks. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope you guys thought that was good. I, I knew this one would be sort of interesting because it's, it's just really crazy. I mean, just in terms of a, uh, like I could probably now tell the story pretty quickly. You know, you could just say that, you know, the girls came to the town to hang out in Ocean City and then they decided to leave early to because they were going to go on a trip with uh, one of the girls family members so they left at 4 30 in the morning from Simon house here they drove over this bridge and when they got to this side of the uh, they had breakfast over here at summer's point diner got there at 4 45 and apparently left there at 5 30 and from there they drove to on to the garden uh yeah, Garden State Parkway, turn right there, and then there was these three boys sleeping in a vehicle right here, and apparently uh, they were asleep when the girl's car pulled up here, uh, Susan and Elizabeth's car pulled up right here, and they were, they were sleeping. And when they woke up, the car is still sitting there, and then two of them hitchhiked to go get some gas and then you know got back at like eight something and the car is still sitting there but during that time the girls were murdered in here one of the original articles said that uh they were murdered with they were murdered one was fully clothed the other one was nude and they were both stabbed and beaten then they found the knife and car keys down in, or not a knife, the knife was ruled out. So they found the car keys down in this area somewhere, thrown out of another vehicle. And uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's just really weird, you know? That there, especially the, the fact that the three girls are here and then a, a police officer drove by when the car was there and didn't see either of these two cars. Like he just wasn't paying attention or something. And then later he saw it parked there and he, then he had it towed. But it kind of makes you wonder about him because of that. You know, he's somebody that you just sort of wonder about a little bit because how did he not see it, first of all? And then why was he so, you know, I guess he, he did have it towed. And I guess that's coincidental or whatever, but it's just, you know, something to wonder about. Sure. So you got the three boys, them, and then the serial killer angle or some random person. So anyways, I thought that was one of the better, longer ones that we've done. But see how awesome the newspapers were back then? They have everything. You know, the parents came down. They even rented a helicopter to try to find uh, the car, but the car was towed. Had the car still been sitting there, they would have seen it originally or not, not had to spend the money on renting the helicopter but it was towed somewhere uh, 
Oh, you're taking that? Good night, American lady. Yeah, so tomorrow, uh, early, later we've got the, uh, the, um, well, tomorrow we got some more area shit going on. <laughs> I'll have to put that together later. And then I thought I'd play you guys the... There was actually an appeal court hearing. That was pretty interesting. So, going to check that one out. Yeah, we, they, we already went through that, Zozo. They explained why in the articles, why he had it towed and stuff like that. Yeah, so... They, 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 he typed in the number. It turns out it was a car that was not stolen, so it was illegally parked there, and that's when you immediately have them towed. That was in the articles. All right, everybody. Thank you all for being here tonight. Appreciate it. Um, you know, that's sort of what happens when you, you don't get to watch the whole show and you just watch part of it, so there's a lot of stuff that's just in there already. How's the uh, the little dog doing? <clears throat> Let's see. The newspaper had all the info. Yep, pretty much. Didn't have the part about the hair being tied around a tree. I don't know. It's hard to believe that part of it. That's just kind of a random factoid there but anyways everybody thank you all for being here we will uh, see you tomorrow and uh, who knows what tomorrow will bring <laughs> all right so thank you very much and as I always say everybody until next time be safe out there and, well, by, by the way thanks for hitting the goal yeah, thank you very much crime thing for quite a while now and during this whole time, I have not seen one person that is a crime dissector, like rejecter, I'm a certified evil lie detector, gonna get ya, gonna get ya, if you try and play me like an old projector, crime sector is my nectar, Professor Grey is gonna give another lecture, crime collector, freak connector, and I'm always gonna be a pop detector, fool deflector, interceptor, and I'm meaner than a spectrum with a vector on his pecker with all the spectrum. Just remember, I have a tip of fucking checker. I have no agenda, I don't have a tender. And I'll send it to you straight with a blender. And in the end, I'm gonna send ya on a mission to reveal the true offender. Oh wow, that yeah, Nick slaps! Look, look at me, everybody! <laughs> <laughs> what the hell does that even mean? All right, everybody, we'll see you tomorrow, and be safe out there.